bem, hoje nós estamos dando sequência às nossas atividades aqui no Instituto Brasiliense de Direito Público e temos a honra de receber amigos, convidados é, de diferentes países, professor Ulrich Becker, nosso amigo de Unique, também o professor Mário Oliver da, da Universidade Northwest da África do Sul, que já esteve inclusive conosco aqui, e também o professor Paulo Mota Pinto, nosso amigo de Coimbra. Vamos começar essa, esse painel com a exposição do professor Ulrich Becker. Os dois primeiros temas têm a ver com muitos dos debates que nós temos tido no, no Brasil sobre direito à saúde, não é? todas essas questões que temos vivenciado também no Supremo Tribunal Federal, e aqui se cita os casos da África do Sul, é, exemplos, e também o caso Nicolaus, da, 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 da Alemanha, em suma, é, é, a, a dificuldade de implementação de direitos é, sociais. Agradeço também a presença da nossa diretora, professora Fátima Cartacho, e de, a presença de todos os, os senhores né, para esse debate. E nós combinamos para um, um tipo de organização que é, a língua comum seria inglês, o professor Paulo Mota Pinto vai falar em português, porque, claro, facilita então também a, a, a comunicação, e aí isso também seria abusivo, né? é, é, pedir que um português aqui falasse em, em inglês, mas, portanto, a, a, a palestra vai correr, as palestras vão correr inicialmente em inglês. E eu passo logo a palavra, então, ao professor é, Ulrich Becker, que é, é diretor é, do Instituto Max Planck de Direito Social de Munique, e tem hoje um diálogo muito é, intenso com o Brasil. Eu mesmo tive em julho, lá juntamente com o Ingo, é, não só na sede do Instituto, da, da, do Max Planck Instituto, lá, como depois estivemos é, na Frau Insel, é, participando do seminário sobre temas relevantes, inclusive na questão da saúde. Passo a palavra ao professor Ulrich Berg. Okay, it's better now, so you can hear me. Good. Okay, so I'm sorry. Bom dia is the only word I can say in Portuguese. So I'm I'm, I'm sorry you have to follow now the the English uh, uh, presentation. If you have problem to understand it, or if if there was something you would like to ask in between, just do it. It should should be a problem. I will try not to take too much time. That should be about 30, 35 minutes or something. And it will be on social rights, also on social rights quite in general in Germany. And as Professor Mendes already said, one of the interesting cases we have there, it's the Santa Claus decision. We call it Santa Claus because everybody thought now the Federal Constitutional Court is bringing gifts or sending gifts around to everybody. Social rights, you know, we open it up. And what I'm going to speak about is the situation in Germany and why it is quite particular. And I would like to try to explain it and then I would like to come to some mechanisms how we try to protect social rights anyhow. So in a certain way we have a first look on the, at, at the uh, German constitution, which is called basic law, by the way. Uh, we will see what's in there. And then we have a second look at the mechanisms there, which we actually can find there. Okay, let's start with the constitution as such. And uh, you can already see it there. I call it the soberness of the German constitution. If we look at the first chapter on fundamental rights there, so it starts with the Article 1, and this is on human dignity. So this is the very, you know, Western tradition to put the human dignity in front. 
and to say this is the most important part. Mankind or human beings are firstly protected. They, they before the political community in a certain sense. So this is the political idea behind them. And then we have a series of fundamental rights which follow there. So this is a whole catalog. But it's a catalog of civil liberties, political and procedural rights. This is what you can find in the first chapter on fundamental rights in the German constitution. And if you have a look at the development in Europe, and I mean not the different European states so much, but the European Union, which is the regional organization, as you know. If you look at this, we also find there a, a, a charter on fundamental rights now, which became binding with the Treaty of Lisbon. And in this chart on fundamental rights, the starting point is also human dignity. So it's the first point you can find there. And then again, you have a whole catalog of different fundamental rights. But the difference is that in this charter of the European Union, you also find a chapter on solidarity. Solidarity with different kinds of social rights. And these are more or less the well-known different types of social rights, like the right to labor or the right for employed earners, the right to social security, but also the right to health. And if we go back now to the German constitution, we can see after this first chapter, there is more or less nothing. No social rights involved there. The only social rights we have within the first chapter, I have to say, are about three specific discriminatory clauses or discrimination, anti-discrimination clauses, right? Three different ones, one on, on men and women, the other one on, uh, in favor of disabled persons, and then another one in favor of, of uh, children. Um, that's, that's it. So we do not have this catalog of social rights. The only thing we have, it's, and this is outside the chapter of fundamental rights, is what we call the social state clause. And it reads as follows, you can read it there. The Federal Republic of Germany is a democratic and social federal state. And that's it. So you can also see it's very short. Just the word social there. And then the question, of course, is what does social mean? And this is a question we, we cannot solve that easily, of course. We're still discussing it maybe today. But this is very really important to see. It's outside the chapter on fundamental rights, which means this has an objective meaning, an objective dimension only. OK, why is it? So what is, what is the historical background of all this? And I think it's quite interesting, because once you look back at the history of German constitutional law, you will see that it had been different at one time. You could say, upon a time, and this is a bit like a fairy tale, upon a time we had been one of the front runners of social rights. You see their front runner. This is the Weimar Constitution of 1919. This was actually the third constitution where you could find social rights. The first one was the one of the Soviet Union of 1917, the second of Mexico, and then I think it was Weimar already. So you see, that was, was, we were quite ahead in a certain way. And there you could find rights. It's a bit, maybe a bit comp comparable to the Constitution of Portugal, because there you could find economic and social rights, and also rights of families and the family life in a certain way. And one important article there read, and this is Article 161, in order to maintain health and the ability to work, in order to protect motherhood and to take precautions against the economic consequences of age, weakness, and the vicissitudes of life, the Reich, which is the state, of course, establishes a comprehensive insurance with participation of the insured. So this is about uh, establishing a social and a comprehensive social security system. Right. So we had this Weimar Constitution, but the experience in Germany was that it didn't work that well. I put it quite cautiously, as you can see there. So social rights, I would say, did not play a significant role in the Roaring Twenties. 
when economy was really booming. Nor did it play a specific role to prevent from poverty in the 30s when economy collapsed. So I would say the social rights in the Weimar Constitution were not strong enough in order to really influence social life. And maybe the same could be said about the Constitution as such, because as you know, the Constitution was still in force when the Nazi regime took over, right? So it was not strong enough in order to defend us against this regime. So, and this is, if you want so the one lesson the fathers and mothers of the basic law learned from this time. They wanted to establish a very strong constitution. They said we should concentrate on enforceable rights. We should have a constitution which really helps to defend the right of people against public power. And this is, by the way, also why they also founded and established a very strong federal constitutional court a constitutional court which is also accessible to the individuals and which really protects against public powers. So this is, I think, the, 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 the main reason you would see if you, if, you, if you were asking you why don't we find social rights in the German constitution. But I think there's another one, and I would go through that very quickly. This is so, sort of an empirical study to a certain way, because if you look at what was actually going on, on the level of protection of social rights, then you will see that the Constitution did not matter that much. So I, I, here you can see two lines. The blue one is what, the constitutional law line, right? And the red one is, is how to say, the social security line. So it's about the, the uh, acts of parliaments who really put into being social security systems. And then, of course, you can see the starting point. There's the Constitution of 1871, which was the first German constitution, but it did not have any individual rights. So this was more or less a confederation or something. You know, it was something in between. This is, by the way, we um, all, all the, the, the learned colleagues worked in the 19th century so much on constitutional law because that was very unclear what it really was at this time. Yes. So. Um, and then social insurance came into being, and this is very famous because this is the Bismarckian social insurance schemes you can see there, which was in the 80s of the 19th century. And you, as you can see, no constitutional basis for that, of course, quite obviously. And then we had the Weimar Constitution. And you have already seen this Article 161, and one would think now social insurance should, be, should have been enhanced at this time, as it was put in this article, right? It was the task of the state to do more social insurance. And indeed, what we did, we introduced an unemployment scheme in 1927. So we did that. But without any reference to the Constitution. It's interesting. I looked up the materials. There was no discussion on the constitutional background there. So you can see, more or less, it worked independently. And quite the same, by the way, after the basic law, when we had this social state clause, we had a major reform of our old age pension system in 1957. This really was more or less a new system. We introduced a new system then. And no reference, again, no reference being made to the Constitution there. So what I would say, what a bit, if you want, so the, the outcome of this actual factual development is that Constitution in Germany did not matter that much if it comes to the, to the actual um, installment of social security systems. And this is interesting. Now it's important, I think. Um, I'm not going to say that the constitution would not matter, generally speaking. You know, I, I, I do not intend to say that. Because we very well know that in specific situations, also in this regard, social rights or social protection, the institution can play a very important role. I would say especially if you have situations of, how to say, of, of transition, you know, of a profound change, then new constitutions play a major role. We can see it, and I think we will see it in the case of South Africa, where the constitution is, is quite important also in this regard. Portugal maybe is a nice example. Um, because after the revolution, also new social security seems, uh, systems had been set up. So at least you see there was a coincidence there, and the constitution, I guess, mattered quite, quite a lot. This is different. 
So the only thing I can say is it very much depends on the historical situation and also on the institutions which are already there, which are already in force in order to understand how the constitution works there. So that's the first point. And then the second is, although we do not have these social rights within the German constitution, we have developed mechanisms in order also to protect social rights, also individual positions there. And this is the next step I, I, I would like to come to. So the different dimensions of fundamental rights. In a certain way, we're going back to the first chapter, right, and seeing what did legal doctrine make out of this first chapter, actually. And I think there are different, different ways in order to reformulate or to invent a social dimension of these fundamental rights. The first one was more or less a theoretical debate. This the theoretical debate was in the late 1960s and the 1970s. And this was a time when economy growth, we had economic growth, when we had the call for more democracy, when we had a lot of political changes and so on. And this, was, this also infected, in a certain way, the legal doctrine debate, which is quite understandable. And then the question came up, if we have fundamental freedoms in a negative, and they have a negative dimension, they protect the individual against public power, why shouldn't they also have sort of a positive dimension? For example, if you have the right to property, so you can protect yourself if you have some property, but does it not also mean that you should get some property? You see? So what, what, it's, what it's before, in a certain way. And quite the same with the right to professional activities. We protect the professional activities in Germany, but we do not have a right to work. What, what, what can you do with your professional activities if you do not have any work at all? So that was a question that came up. And the idea was in order you know, to enhance, in a certain way, these fundamental freedoms and also introduce a certain social dimension. But this was, I have to say, a purely theoretical debate. And it stopped at the late 70s or somewhere then, because this went far too, too wide, I have to say. Because this would have meant every fundamental right, every, every negative right is a fundamental right in the sense of an individual right, is also a social right at the same time. And then, of course, you have the problems this does only make sense if it's all also about individual protection at the same time. And this is a really far-reaching interpretation of the Constitution. So it's um, no wonder, I would say, that the courts did not follow this approach. And I think all the debate uh, did not go beyond the 1970s. Instead, the, con the Federal Constitutional Court developed two other quite powerful mechanisms in order to protect at least partly also a social dimension. The first one is about the equal distribution of facilities. Um, and this was the numerous clauses case. I do not know, have you already dealt also with German constitutional law to a certain extent? Is this also part of, of, of uh, the classes? Yes. yes, it is, it is. So, so, you, so you might have heard about this. You, of course, have, but, <laughs> but maybe, maybe also the students uh, have already heard about this numerous clauses case, which, which was uh, uh, about universities and places at the university, right? And um, this is, I think, more or less the only case, really, and, and we debated whether this was a positive dimension in this sense, because it opened up, in a certain way, the universities. But I would say not, it's not a proper positive dimension. It's about uh, distribution. This means we already had facilities. And once you have the facilities, then you have to open them, right? But it does not mean that you have to create new facilities. This is very important. So equal distribution works rather well there. And it works also for social benefits, I have to say. But it does not mean that you would have to create something at the same time. This is a difference. Okay, that's very important to see. 
And we just have this one case. We have a few other cases on, on facilities, but it's, uh, that, this is the, the, the most important one still. Yes, and then we have a, and this is, I think, more far-reaching uh, uh, um, development in legal doctrine. And you might also know that, because it's very famous in, in, in Brazil, uh, I, I just want to mention it. This is the duty or obligation to protect fundamental freedoms, right? I would say this is one of the, the, the most important developments of legal, legal doctrine in, in fundamental rights law, in Germany at least. And I, I, I think you know that because it started with the Lüth case, the one where, where you had two private parties and some, it was not a contractual but a civil law relationship between them and the Federal Constitutional Court stated that the fundamental freedoms, all is, this is also a system of values. And with this argument, having a system of values, the state has also the obligation to protect every individual against infringement from third parties, from private parties. So this is about horizontal dimension at the same time, right? That's the starting point. It's quite famous. And then we had other uh, cases, abortion one. This is really about the state obligation. So the state also has to protect. It's not a, only against the, the, the private uh, law relationships. Schleier, very important case. Um, and, oh, oh, sorry. And then, uh, yes, and this, this is the case law, more or less, of the Federal Constitution Court. And what you can say at the end is that the state really has a duty or obligation to protect individuals against private infringements, but also against uh, or, or every public power has also this duty to protect and to do at least something. And what does it mean to do something? This is an interesting question because then, of course, the question arises whether it also means that there is some sort of subjective dimension of this objective dimension. This is a difficult question. I think this is why the US Supreme Court never accepted this doctrine, really. So they, they, they're very hesitant about this, because they're saying, OK, yeah, once you have this obligation, it might turn into sort of, of a right. And, and then uh, the, the function of the, the, um, the traditional function of the fundamental rights uh, will be reversed in a certain way. But in Germany, this is let's say, state-of-the-art doctrine, at least. And, of course, you find it in human rights law. You know, every, every, every uh, committee in order to, to uh, implement human rights says you there are three dimensions of the human rights, and one of them is to protect. I think Marius will also come to that, right, to, uh, afterwards. Okay, now, it's the next step. As the Santa Claus case, came in 2005. And up to 2005, the idea was, yes, this is an objective dimension, this ob uh, dimension to protect. An individual might, might try even to invoke it before a court, even to say, this is a violation of the duty to protect. But the courts always said, yes, but it's up to the legislator to find the right way in order to protect so. That wasn't the Schleier case, very famous, for example, where he said, OK, it has to be up to the legislator to decide, right? Now, in 2005, we have an interesting case. And this case was a case of the fundamental constitu uh, federal constitutional court. Um, an insured person, so a person covered by the statutory health insurance scheme in Germany, suffered from a very severe illness. It was called Duchenne muscular dystrophy which is a life-threatening illness, I have to say. And the insured asked for a particular medical treatment there, which was a bit strange because it was bioresonance, a bioresonance treatment. And um, his sickness fund refused to provide him with this treatment because he said it's not part of our basket of benefits because we have the traditional treatments there and we only have treatments which are effective and this is not proven to be effective, generally speaking at least. So it was not part of the, 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 the basket. And the social courts, they, they, they uh, also denied the right to this particular treatment according to the existing, I would say, bylaws of the statutory health insurance system. But the Federal Constitution Court took a different position there. It stated that although there is Although there is no constitutional right to specific health care in general, the refusal to grant a medical treatment may violate the right to life and physical integrity. 
And the idea behind that is there is the duty of the state or the obligation of the state to protect individuals ag against infringements or to protect the life of individuals in, in, in general. And then the court stated, if there is a life-threatening illness, that means that at least a certain minimum of benefits have to be provided for. And by the way, this is the case, the Santa Claus case, and you can see why, why Santa Claus became so famous. Of course, it was the 6th of December, you know, but the idea behind this is the symbolic meaning in a certain way, right? Because, you know, it went around with all these, these nice gifts. But it said individual rights to medical treatment in life-threatening situations. We have another case, which is also very, very interesting, I have to say. You could also discuss it. This is the ca a, a case on the minimals, minimum subsistence in Germany. It's a bit later. It's from 2010, from the 9th of February, where the court said there's also an individual right to minimum subsistence. And this means minimum subsistence in two, or in two aspects or two dimensions. First one is, is the physical dimension. So it's the right to survive in a certain way. You get food, right? You get something to drink and all these things. Also healthcare, by the way. And the second one is the socio-cultural dimension of this minimum subsistence. And the court also there said it's up to the legislator, of course, to decide on what this minimum subsistence actually is. Because this is a very difficult question. So it's up to the legislator. And he has even more discretion in this sphere of social, cultural, physical minimum. But if he do, does not do anything, or if he do, does not do obviously enough, then you can rely on the Constitution. And this is Article 1, human dignity in uh, cooperation, or not in cooperation, in, 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 in uh, how to say, in addition with the social store state principle. So you take both together, right? takes a social state principle, like the idea of, 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 of protecting the people, and then the Article 1 in order to put a subjective dimension to that. That's the idea. Of course, this is also very disputable. Right, but I'm, I'm, let, let me come back to the, to the healthcare case, because then, of course, I, you, you, you might imagine, because we do not have the social rights in the Constitution, we have this case, so... I would say this uh, particular decision of the Federal Constitutional Court attracted very much criticism. Nearly all reactions, at least from constitutional uh, uh, law scholars, and also from judges of social courts, I have to say, were negative. You could even say they were devastating to a certain degree. And they focused on two points. First, they argued that the Constitutional Court had left his own path of well-established legal doctrine because the result of its decision could not be based on the doctrine of duties to protect fundamental rights. So it went beyond this doctrine. That's the first point. And the second, it's a very well-known point of critique. It's that the judgment was going beyond the powers of judiciary and so in so far infringing the, um, the, the uh, separation of powers. Okay, the first point, legal doctrine one. Um, yes, it's true that this duty to protect was foremost invented in order to protect from interference from other private actors. That was the Lüth case, right? But it was already put a bit forward in the abortion one and in the Schleier case, and this is why I showed it to you, that there was also a more general duty to protect. But still, this was always combined with the discretionary power of the legislator. So the court always stated, yes, there is also a sort of subjective dimension, but the legislator has to decide. And this is really the first case, I think, in which the, then the federal constitutional court said, no, this specific treatment has to be provided for. And you see the difference there. But I think there was an additional argument, which is quite interesting. And this argument is, is the following. The court said, if the state government sets up an obligatory social insurance scheme, this scheme has also to be effective, right? If you have an obligatory scheme, it has to be effective because you have to pay contributions, you can't go to a private insurance at the same time, and so on. And that means if it has to be effective, it should at least provide you 
with the necessary treatment in cases of, of, of life-threatening illnesses. So this was the argument. And if you see this, then, and, and if you take, take the, the wording of the basic law, then you would say this decision was not only based on per, um, Article 2, Paragraph 2, which is the right to life, but also on Article 2, Paragraph 1, which is the, the, the protection of individual freedom in general. Okay, we might believe that or not, and we might think it's a good argument, but at least it's an argument. And the second point, the division of powers point, there I think it's important to see it's true that we already had some sort of statutory background in this case. So we had statutory instruments, or at least bylaws, of the statutory health insurance. And this is very important. I think it's important um, in order to understand maybe how healthcare systems work. You normally have a more or less general individual right, let's say a right to the necessary medical treatment. But of course, then the question arises, what does necessary mean in this regard? We have a lot of different treatments for different cases, situations, and so on. And the question then is, what specific therapy do you get in a specific situation? What specific drug or pharmaceutical can you get in a specific situation? And so on. In other words, you have to concretize this quite open right to necessary treatment. And it's a good idea to do it in an abstract general way. This is very important normally. So we have some institutions, like a committee, who decides on what treatment you would get normally. And this is more or less in every state of the world. We have different committees at different places and so on, and we can discuss it, but I'm not going to go into details of the German health insurance system because, you know, this is a bit away from a more theoretical debate. But just in order to know, there is a statutory background, and the idea is that you need some sort of general abstract definition of what really healthcare needs. You always need it. So, once so you have this individual case, of course, you override right, this general legal framework and background in a certain way. It's like having a, a, a net and you put you know, a needle in it and then you will have a hole. This is the thing. And I think in, in, in so far the criticism is at least understandable. It might not be so difficult in Germany because the Federal Constitutional Court really restricted this, and this is important to see, to extraordinary individual cases, really cases of emergency, I would say. And this is why also the budget is not so much concerned at the end. So all the budgetary arguments against this decision are not very really strong. And you can see it from the subsequent jurisprudence of social courts that who have to implement this decision in practice now. And you can, can imagine, we have a lot of cases now where the plaintiff says, oh, I have a constitutional right to this specific treatment there. Okay? That's normal. Everybody wants to rely on this, on this Santa Claus decision. But the social courts in Germany, they're very reluctant, and they really try to, how to say, to, to cut it down and to only say in very extraordinary situations, life-threatening, uh, within a year there has to be the threat that you can die and things like that, so they really cut it down. And that's the outcome of the decision, at least at the moment. So I would say it's really, you can imagine, it's like an emergency exit. So we have some individual e emergency exit to this more or less generally working system, which makes it a bit different, I think, from the situation in Brazil. Okay, let me come to the end. What, is, what are the final observations? It's, 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 let, let me just sum it up, maybe, some, some remarks. First of all, we do not have any social rights in the Constitution, only these specific discriminatory clauses, but, but, but not the well-known uh, set of, of social rights. And this is due to the historical situation in Germany, but I think we can also explain it from our empirical experience, right, of setting up social security systems. Yet we have uh, some mechanisms, we have developed some mechanisms also in, protect, in, in protecting social rights, also on an individual side. We have the social state clause as an objective dimension, and then we have this equal distribution of goods and, and benefits, 
and also the, the protection or duty to protect fundamental freedoms. And we have, and this is the last remark, in very extraordinary situations, even a subjective, subjective dimension of this objective dimension of fundamental rights. And this brings me, in a certain way, to the end. And I would say, you can see there, we do not have these social rights. But there might be a specific need for them. And if you do not find them in the treaty, so you find it a bit otherwise, which says social rights are really fundamental to every political community. Thank you so much. <laughs> this door closed again, which I think is important, so I totally agree. I, I, I think this sort of individualizing healthcare through adjudication is a problem for equality and for working system, because then you have to finance all the individual cases and what is less, uh, uh, left for the others. So that really can become a problem. And the only way to close it again is to have a well-working, I'm afraid, a well-working system. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, but this is what I meant, you know, when I said it's a problem to have all these cases because it will be very costly and you will have to spend a lot of money and this money will be missing maybe for other things. Um, yes, I think first of all we have to, of course, we have to make a distinction and maybe I didn't do that uh, very clearly yet. We have to make a distinction between the benefits you should get based on the existing statutes and the things which are not yet in the statutes, which are in innovative or, 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 or which are about the facilities or things like that, right? If you do not get the, the, the benefits which are in the statutes, we would, wouldn't say this is a constitutional law-based case, but it's a, 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 a case based on the statutory law. So this is just about the, the, the working of the system. 
And of course, every social court would give you the benefit if, you, if it's denied uh, wrongly against the existing law. So that's not a question. So this is out, right? So the interesting questions are those in which you have either innovative uh, therapies or drugs or, or something which is not already in the basket because you do not have proof, enough proof, or your commission, which is responsible for that, um, does not have the proof or did not decide about that yet. That's the one thing. And the other thing is the, the amount of facilities you have, hospitals, for example, right? The question is, do I get hospital treatment within three months, within six months, or do I get it immediately, for example? So these are, these are two different things. And I, I would say for, for the last two um, um, categories of, of, of questions, there has to be some sort of general regulation. This is the important thing. Because what is behind that? It's a political decision on, on the level of healthcare you get. Of course, you always need emergency care. So we're not talking about what some, some people call primary healthcare or something. We're not talking about that. But we're talking about the amount of facilities you actually need in order to have a proper, let's say, a proper um, uh, uh, provision of, of healthcare benefits. And there, I think, it's important to have a general abstract regulation on this matters. Because it's always, you know, on the, on the question, how much money do you spend? Mm -hmm. And this should be up to the legislator, because he's the only who has really the legitimization for that. It's not about the judges, because you have to take a general decision there. This is what, which makes these cases so problematic, in my view. And especially on drugs which are not yet proven. I, I remember there was at least one case, but there might be more in Brazil nowadays, where you can get uh, some drugs which might be on the market uh, somewhere else, but you do not have market access in, in Brazil or Latin America. That's very really questionable, I would say. So you can see, I think we can, we could, we could make a sort of, a, we could try to make sort of a systematic distinction between different types of categories. And I would always say, so if it, yeah, 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 yeah. And the regulation is the, the, the more important thing and, and it has to be abstract, generally abstract regulation. Because if it comes to the individual case, you, you always see the people suffering from something. Yeah, they, yeah, but this is not the right way to design on that. We know that from economic, by the way. Uh, you know, the, if the question arises, um, how much would you spend for your health? Of course, it makes a, to a, a great difference whether I ask it to you now and you feel in a good state and you're asking, okay, what will I, what will I lay aside in order to prevent me from, from, from all the illnesses and, and, and things? Or I ask you when you're ill. Then you will spend everything. And then, of course, also in Germany, I have to say, the new drugs, new therapies, these are normally the cases where you really have to spend a lot of money and you do not know whether they work. Especially uh, the cancer and anti-cancer drugs, you know, they're, they're, they're very, very expensive. And then the next question is also interesting, and we, we don't do that yet in Germany, is the question of uh, how would you rationalize maybe your budget? This is also a nice question, right? What is, what is about the, 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 the cost-benefit relation there? How do you deal with that? At this stage in Germany, we say we have enough money for everything, so we cover whatever is necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question is what is necessary, actually, but we, we say that. In the United Kingdom, it's different. They have an institute there, and they have the idea of, of really testing the cost-benefits relation as well. So that's also an interesting point. Once you do that, for example, this has to be generally accepted. You can't come in individual cases and can say, yeah, but in my case it's so different, I need, I need more, you know? So it's, um, it's very difficult. But you really have to make some distinctions at least, and then I think in a certain way one would have to put it back. And this is the problematic thing of our case as well, because this is also a bit against the abstract general regulation, and the only thing you can have there is this sort of emergency. But I have to say, it's not very really well defined. We're going to have a conference uh, in 10 days in, in Poland, and we will discuss it again there with other German scholars, and they're very much against this decision. Mm -hmm. So I'm amongst the few which are at least in favor, generally speaking. Because I say, OK, it's sort of an individual emergency exit. But yeah, but, but it's, it's, you really have to take care. Otherwise, you destroy the system of general abstract regulations, which are, in a certain way, always the question how much money you put to health. Because you also need the money for education or other things. 
And this is oh, one thing you have to take. It's a decision you have to make on an abstract level. I'm, I'm sorry for the judges. <laughs> <laughs> Should I likewise try to say bom dia? Uh, it's uh, my esteemed privilege um, and honor to be with you here today and to uh, present to you some perspectives on this African system. May I thank in particular Professor Judge Mendes um, for the invitation and for all the kind arrangements made by the um, people from the Institute um, I must say that I'm very impressed, not just with the Institute, of course, but also with um, the particular approach that you have in Brazil to involve the judiciary so closely with, with economic, uh, academic development in a country. I think this is, uh, provides quite some thought um, 
you know, for other countries to how to go about. And it makes a lot of sense in my own personal view. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the task to, to talk to you about the South African system of um, social rights. It's a kind of a broad-based approach. Uh, I would like to um, raise with you some of the fundamental perspectives, some of the developments, um, and of course also with reference to some of the case law. Unlike the German constitution, the South African constitution is of um, fairly recent origin, at least the constitution of South Africa that now provides for uh, fundamental rights and socio-economic rights in particular. Um, in fact, it dates back to 1996, so less than 20 years, 19 years in existence. Um, and uh, we have uh, several institutions that were created under the constitution to give effect to the constitution and to social rights and fundamental rights more generally. Uh, the most important institution in this regard is the Constitutional Court, and the Constitutional Court has been very active in this area of social rights, uh, in particular in the beginning years, uh, where it really broke some ground, so to say, and uh, developed a framework for, for uh, not just future judgments and future development of the legal system, but clearly, as you will see um, in the course of our discussion, um, a major impact on, on the policy context um, in, in South Africa, and one would like to add, perhaps rightly so. Um, so the uh, discussion in this regard is, is perhaps uh, different from the, from the very interesting and uh, well-developed German system. Um, I'm going to take you back to where, where it all comes from, actually, because I don't think that one can understand at least the... Um, See how we move this forward. Sorry, how? Uh, uh, oh, thank you. Um, I don't think one can understand the South African constitutional context and its emphasis on social rights without a proper understanding of the, of course, the history of the country. Um, of course, as you know very well, there are different approaches to constitutional interpretation. Um, and at a very early stage, the question before the Constitutional Court was, um, do we adopt a more historical, a more textual approach, or perhaps a more purposive, or as it's sometimes called, a teleological approach? And the Court made it clear that, as you'll see from one or two of the quotations, that our task in South Africa is, is clearly to look at the purpose of the Constitution and the fundamental rights against the background of the uh, socio-economic um, and, if you like, even the political history of South Africa. Um, so that was made clear from, from the very beginning, and you'll see this reflected in, in some of what we will be saying. There clearly is and was a political imperative for the new constitution in 1994 when we had the first proper democratic elections in the country. There was an expectation that um, the new government would, would come up with a constitutional order that would not just serve the people of the country generally, and not just a segment of the population or the whole population, but, um, but also that the new constitutional order through the fundamental rights provisions, for example, would uh, deal emphatically with the history of um, trampling on human rights under the old apartheid regime. Um, unless we understand this, we will never understand the orientation, not just of the constitution, but the development that the jurisprudence took in uh, South Africa. One of the factors in this regard is, in fact, the second issue there, and that is the marginalization and exclusion of the majority. This was the old system. Majority was by far uh, excluded. So how do we include them? Not just through legislative means, but how do you interpret the Constitution to make sure that they are included? So we have some fascinating judgments in the area of equality, for example. Um, the uh, notion of uh, substantive equality, very well developed in the constitutional court jurisprudence, um, giving preference, if you like, from a constitutional perspective 
of uh, to those who were historically marginalized. And for example, it's very interesting if you look at the way in which the equality provision, section 9 of the Constitution, has been uh, formulated. It starts off in section 9 by, 1 by saying that everyone uh, is equal before the law. Uh, but then in section 9, subsection 2, it says that, listen carefully, in order to achieve equality, um, what is allowed is to give preference to people and groups that were historically uh, disadvantaged. I'm sort of summarizing section 9, subsection 2. So interestingly, other than, for example, would be the position in the United States and the Supreme Court jurisprudence there, the taking of redress of, um, or, or, or measures to redress past discrimination in the South African constitutional framework is not seen as an exception to the equality rule, but as a fulfillment of the equality obligation. And the way in which the Constitutional Court has interpreted this um, in several cases has been absolutely uh, remarkable. Uh, we'll touch on one or two of those cases, it's just too much. The socioeconomic profile in South Africa is equally important, not just the exclusion majority, but poverty and deprivation. Deprivation, of course, the broader term, going much beyond poverty. People are deprived, not just in the economic sense of not having, you know, being poor, but in uh, one of the cases that I will be dealing with is, is the area of housing, access to adequate housing as a separate constitutional right. Uh, it was clear that as a result of past policies of the then apartheid regime, um, large segments of the South African population became both landless and homeless. And that needed to be addressed. And again, we'll see how this was addressed, not just by the legislature, but through the constitutional jurisprudence. So addressing poverty and deprivation. Um, so already it gives us a clear message that the constitution and the social rights part in particular um, are there to, to address vulnerability. Uh, and I must say this is in line, of course, with um, interpretation given to, for example, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights by the UN Committee in this regard. So this is nothing new from a comparative perspective. <clears throat> so what then is the overall purpose of the constitutional framework? As I've said, it flows from what we have said to address past human rights abuses and to deal with exclusion and ensure integration. You can already see this from preamble of the Constitution. And then in one of the early cases of the Constitutional Court, State versus Mishlingu, the court had this to say, and I'm quoting, the Constitution introduces, introduces democracy and equality for the first time in South Africa. It acknowledges a past of intense suffering and injustice and promises a future of reconciliation and reconstruction, unquote. And this is the basis of the approach in most of the adjustments concerning social, social rights. Right. Therefore, what the Constitution does, and it does so in a separate chapter, chapter two of the South African Constitution, entitled The Bill of Rights, is to include all three uh, uh, generations of rights, first, second, and third. So the political and civil rights, evidently there. Importantly, quite a range of socio-economic rights. Um, and finally, a few of the third generation rights, environmental and similar rights. Uh, the approach, interesting, unlike some other countries, um, the, uh, was not to describe in detail all the dimensions of these rights, but sort of to capture the essence of the right, maybe some exceptions or some particular areas of application of the right, but to leave the rest of the detail unpacking of the fundamental rights to, in particular, the constitutional court. Um, and this is what the court has, has been doing. Um, it's a particular approach, uh, maybe for South Africa the right approach, because uh, you can't really prescribe and foresee all the situations and all the context which needed to be addressed. 
uh, through the constitutional jurisprudence. Uh, so first, second and third generation rights very much um, um, reflected. Constitutional obligations are placed on, on the state. In fact, and we don't have time to discuss this really, but the obligations are imposed not only on the state. Uh, Section 8 of the Constitution makes it clear that uh, if you take into account the nature of a particular right and the obligations imposed by the right, um, private actors may also be bound, and of course very often are bound, if you think, for example, in the labor relations area, where private actors would need to abide by the constitutional framework. Um, um, so, to respect, protect, and fulfill is the basic command in section 7, subsection 2. Uh, in fact, the starting point would probably be section 2 of the constitution, um, which says that the constitution is the supreme law of the country, and it binds um, the state in its broad, in the broad sense of the word, including the legislature, the executive, and uh, of course, also judiciary. Um, all law must be in compliance with, with the constitution. In other words, we have a replacement of parliamentary sovereignty, which was in place until 1996, actually 1993. We had, a, we had an interim constitution in 1993, followed then by this final one of 1996. But then there's an interesting um, kind of development as far as some of these uh, socioeconomic rights are concerned, not all of them, is that they would be qualified. Um, for example, the right to access to, uh, to social security or, on the other hand, the right to access to adequate housing would have a qualifier in the same relevant section which would say that the state has to adopt reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources in order to achieve the progressive realization of the said right. Um, and of course the question is why do we have this, what has become known as internal qualifiers to uh, these fundamental rights? Uh, of course the obvious reason is, would be to say, well, you know, it's just such a huge task to, to roll out housing, adequate housing to everybody in the country, or to roll out social security on a comprehensive basis. These are matters that cannot be done overnight. You need a gradual or gradualist approach, an incremental approach, um, which would give sufficient leeway or scope to government or the, or the state as the designer of the policy framework um, to adopt what would be reasonable, so it, it's not prescriptive, uh, yet it has to be reasonable, to take into account the available resources but also then to look at the progressive realization. But I think we have to note two or three important things in this regard. The first is that these internal qualifiers actually start off by saying the state has to adopt reasonable legislative, etc., etc. So it starts off again with the obligation on the state. So what is affected is the modality in which this obligation needs to be fulfilled. Uh, it doesn't it change the fact that there is such an obligation. That's, uh, that's the first point we want to make. The second point is that we always have to read the Constitution in the context of the rest of the Constitution and the rest of the fundamental rights. Um, very often in areas such as housing and in particular in the area of social security, Rights such as a right to equality would play a prominent role. The right to equality is not subject to reasonableness, available resources, and uh, progressive realization. So the point we want to make is that if you will be able to establish a clear breach of the equality provision in relation, for example, to social security, that it is highly debatable whether the state could still say, well, you know, I know, I know that I'm, I'm guilty of unequal treatment, but, um, you know, maybe in 10 years' time I will address this. Um, it, it heightens the liability on the part of the state to, to implement, not necessarily incrementally, but perhaps even immediately. And this is a kind of approach we have seen in some of the judgments, um, which we will return to 
a very, very interesting um, <coughs> development as far as that is concerned. Right. Obligation then also on the courts, tribunals, and fora to promote the spirit, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights, uh, section 39, subsection 2. And as already said, the Constitutional Court establishment um, was um, um, one of the ways in which it was done. The overall purpose of the constitutional framework, <clears throat> at least as far as socioeconomic rights are concerned, summarized by the then Chief Justice Langa, Pius Langa, in the following words, uh, saying that, uh, well, it's the inverted impact on the quality of life of the subject constitution, saying that the vision of the South African constitution is to establish an open democracy committed to social justice and the recognition of human rights. It seeks to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each of them." Unquote. Before I forget, let me just say a few words about the embodiment of human rights or fundamental rights in this chapter 2 of the Constitution on the Bill of Rights. This chapter is specifically entrenched. Entrenchment meaning that um, even though you can limit these rights, uh, which is possible, and we're not going to discuss that, you cannot really take away these rights, at least not easily. Certainly you cannot um, you know, take away this right just through a legislative amendment, even not just through a normal constitutional amendment. You need a special constitutional or special process and a special majority in Parliament to achieve this, and this is not to be obtained easily. And partly for this reason, but I think also because of the understanding or the realization how crucial these fundamental rights are for the operation of South African society. There has not been a single attempt since 1996 to change any of the provisions in the Bill of Rights, even though we have seen something like 20 plus constitutional amendments otherwise. So it tells its own story of how crucial these rights are. Okay, right. So we have the fundamental rights. We also, of course, have the constitutional values, equality, um, human dignity, which are also the subject of se separate rights. And the values, as we all know, of course, are crucially important for the interpretation and understanding of the, the very rights themselves and played a major role in, in many of the judgments that uh, we will be looking at. Uh, but in addition to this, we have um, crucial constitutional principles, um, one of which is the independence of the judiciary, and this has played an equally important role um, also in the debate around the separation of powers. Um, see, what is the role of the, of the judiciary and uh, yeah, we'll come back to that, uh, some very interesting developments. So let me quickly take you through some then of what we could call uh, core considerations or um, core principles underlying the protection of um, socioeconomic rights in the Constitution. The first one we already mentioned is constitutional supremacy. Um, second one, the entrenchment of fundamental rights that we talked about already a general human rights friendly approach. Um, I mean, it's clear from the very provisions themselves. Uh, to some extent, even the kind of similarity um, of some of the provisions um, and the qualification of some of the fundamental rights which I already referred to, the similarity between that and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, uh, which, by the way, South Africa ratified in January this year and raises some very interesting uh, constitutional questions to which we will come back with in a moment. Very interesting is the next issue, an international law-friendly approach. There are several provisions in the Constitution that indicates clearly how important international law um, is um, being regarded uh, by the Constitution, not just binding international law. In fact, the same section 39 of the Constitution which is about the interpretation of the, of the fundamental rights, would stipulate that every court tribunal and forum must take into account international law. And the interpretation given to that particular provision was to say, well, 
taking into account or consideration um, does not equal application necessarily. Um, it's weaker than application. You have to apply, of course, binding international law. But you have to take into account, and this is important, even non-binding international law needs to be considered. So why would the Constitution adopt this particular approach? I think the answer is, is evident in the development of the um, details of the jurisprudential framework around the uh, fundamental rights. Um, we have to um, take from, not merely from other jurisdictions, but more from international, the international standards framework. Right. An intimate relationship between the various categories of fundamental rights. Um, within a moment or so, I'm going to discuss some of the cases with you, and, and there you will see how the different fundamental rights have actually interacted um, in a very concrete way. Um, to arrive at a particular outcome. Um, I'll come back to that. That's, uh, that's perhaps uh, one of the most fascinating developments. Right. Um, let me uh, go immediately actually to, to some of our interesting cases. Um, but let me say this in the first place. There was a question to be answered at the early stage of the constitutional jurisprudence, and this is whether these rights, and I'm referring now to the social or the socio-economic rights, whether they are indeed enforceable. You may know that there is a kind of a public debate worldwide on this, um, perhaps less so than uh, a few decades ago, but certainly the debate is still there. Some, some scholars would be saying that you know, socio-economic rights, by their very nature, may not be enforceable, they may give you direction, but but because of its fiscal impact, for example, you know, you would not be able to enforce them directly. The Constitutional Court made short shift with this argument, making very clear that these rights are indeed enforceable, even if, and I think there's a quotation to this regard in one of the other slides, even if this will have budgetary implications. Um, and this is crucial. And as you'll see, some of these court cases had huge budget, budgetary implications. Um, so the enforceability is um, confirmed. Um, and of course, the wide-ranging powers of the Constitutional Court, issues that it can deal with, the orders it can give, um, perhaps I should say that it's actually sort of limitless. Um, you know, even the examples given in the Constitution, that does not constitute an exclusive list. Um, and one of the interesting things that the Constitutional Court has done is to do what, what I could call effectively a policy review, making it very clear on the one hand that um, development of policy is not a task of the court, but a policy framework that has been put in place needs to be rigorously and vigorously evaluated in the light of the constitutional um, context given what is behind the Constitution of Fundamental Rights, as you will see. So let's deal with a few of these cases, and maybe, forgive me if already you know some of them, um, which I assume might be the case, but let me men nevertheless mention them also within the framework of, of our discussion thus far. Perhaps one of the most groundbreaking judgments was uh, one of the early judgments in the so-called Hrupum case. This case um, concerns or concerned a, a whole community of people who were um, uh, deprived of their land and even their, their homes under the apartheid system through what was then known as the policy of separate group areas for different groups in South Africa. Effectively, they lost everything. So they had no place to stay, and they sort of moved from one area to the other area, and eventually they landed on... Um, on a rugby field, and Brazil, rugby is not that uh, popular, but uh, you all know what rugby is. Next to Cape Town International Airport, uh, which of course is a sore eye to, you know, uh, for, for the local government, the rugby field belonged to a local government. So the local government tried to rely on its uh, normal powers to evict illegal squatters. And that was challenged in the Constitutional Court eventually. Uh, on the basis that the state has a duty to provide 
um, access to adequate housing. What happened in this case is that, that the Constitutional Court took into account the um, progress that has been made by this African government in terms of providing housing after 1996. And it was indeed remarkable. By that stage, about the year 2000, for five years after 96, um, or five years after the new government came into power, uh, the government had already built about five million houses. Um, RDP houses, they were known, reconstruction development program houses, um, to cater for people who sort of had lack of housing. The issue here, however, is, and this is important, is that the housing policy was premised on the basis that at least those who were provided with housing would be able to make some kind of contribution. So the point here is, the then housing policy of this African government did not properly provide for right of access to adequate housing for those who literally had nothing, who couldn't contribute anything. And the court said, but wait a moment. For those who are able to provide for themselves at least somehow, the constitution would oblige the state to provide a framework for their inclusion and their coverage. But for those who are unable to provide for themselves, there is the direct responsibility on the state to provide physically, directly. So for those without any, any form of housing and without the ability to provide for themselves, there's a direct obligation on the state to provide. So the outcome of the order is that the court uh, ordered the South African government to adjust its housing policy to make provision for those categories of people who were not able to, um, uh, to make a contribution to their own housing. Uh, groundbreaking case. Then, in a similar vein, in the area of health or health-related issues, the Treatment Action Campaign case, the TAC, was about the rollout of nevirapine, or then it's a particular form of antiretroviral treatment, HIV AIDS. At that stage, the South African government had a policy of making this available on a pilot basis in two provincial hospitals per province, arguing that it's too expensive to make a, a national countrywide rollout of uh, antiretroviral treatment. This was challenged was challenged on the basis of, in particular, impacting on the right to life, the right to human dignity. The approach adopted by the Constitutional Court is actually very interesting. It said, we hear what you say as a government that it will be expensive to roll out antiretroviral treatment. But our task from a constitutional perspective is to bear in mind who are the people who are being affected by the particular approach adopted in this policy framework, so to say. Those are the people for whom the Constitution was in the first place established, the most vulnerable, if you like. And their plight must be prioritized. This is the starting point on any debate on the impact or the, you know, the impact of social rights or socioeconomic rights in the South African constitutional uh, context. The court said, well, we have to bear in mind the context of not just deprivation, but the context of lack of access to, to uh, well, to health, of course, health services, but also the lack of access, well, uh, the lack of giving proper recognition to the right to human dignity in this kind of case, and the right to life, in fact. One of the Considerations taken into account by the court is the fact that at that stage 70,000 babies were born every year in South Africa already infected. And the court said, well, what are we dealing with here? This is effectively tantamount to a war situation. And legally speaking, if you have to deal with a war situation, you will, you will have to adopt measures that will be war-like measures. So it is incumbent, it is... Um, there's an obligation imposed on the state to adopt appropriate measures that will deal with this catastrophe in South Africa. Um, at that stage, South Africa had one of the highest HIV-AIDS prevalence figures in the whole world. 
And the court said it is not our task in the first place to develop policy. But we have the task of policy review in, in, in view of the constitutional mandate. And in our view, that does not trespass the uh, separation of powers doctrine. The order made by the court was that it ordered the African government to roll out antiretroviral treatment across the spectrum of all public health facilities in South Africa where it was possible to administer antiretroviral treatment. To the extent that today South Africa probably has one of the most successful antiretroviral treatment programs in the world. Um, of course, very expensive. Um, so what do we see? We see the, that in particular areas, given a particular context, the application of fundamental rights in South Africa, or socioeconomic rights, um, where it affects a sizable part of the population, would have major implications for policy review, and of course budgetary implications as well. Um, and of course, one would like to think that this has to be so. Very interesting judgment, the next one is the Corsa case. <clears throat> the Corsa case deals with um, access to non-contributory um, let's call it in social assistance. South Africa has a very extensive social assistance program, um, differently configured than a Brazilian one, but um, nevertheless uh, providing social assistance support to literally 16 million uh, people in South Africa. And I'm talking now about individuals, not, not family-based. Uh, you, know, you have got a very fa kind of a certain extent of family-based program here. 16 million people in South Africa would um, roughly equate to 30% uh, of the South African population directly reliant on social assistance. The question in COSA was whether this social assistance framework should also be extended to permanent residents. Not nationals, but those with permanent resident status. And without going into all of the details of, of the um, argumentation around this, um, safe to say that in the equality clause in section nine, nationality is not mentioned as one of the listed grounds. Yet on the other hand, uh, section nine of the constitution uh, does leave open the possibility of even non-listed grounds uh, to be used as a basis for an anti-discrimination or a discrimination finding. And this is what the court had to do. It, um, uh, well, of course, we don't have time to look at, it, at the distinction and approach between listed and unlisted ground. But the point I want to make now is the following. The point of departure in order to first determine whether discrimination took place, but in particular, importantly, whether discrimination would amount to unfair discrimination, because that is the constitutional prohibition on unfair discrimination the court took into account very particularly the vulnerable status of non-citizens generally, making clear that non-citizens are um, also in terms of international law vulnerable group, uh, and particular uh, categories of, of non-citizens being particularly vulnerable, and this we all know. Using this as a basis to arrive at the finding that in conjunction with other arguments that um, permanent residents were unjustifiably excluded from the social assistance system. It also, um, of course, took into account um, other contexts of the Constitution, indicating that certain, only a few constitutional rights were limited only to citizens, some of the political rights. Uh, there's no justification otherwise in terms of a interpretation of the Constitution to restrict any other right uh, just to citizens. So permanent residents were effectively given access to social assistance on the basis of the course adjustment. Now one of the interesting things in course adjustment is that while the right to access to social security served as the primary basis for its finding, the court relied extensively on the interplay with the other fundamental rights, in particular the right to equality and the right to human dignity. And it is the forcefulness, if I could use the word, of this kind of integrated approach to socioeconomic rights, which um, sort of clearly tilted the scale in favor of the judgment made by the court. 
Um, let me just mention, I'm mindful of our time, um, these two judgments, Goza and Mashava, in, in the same vein, um, on a similar context. Both these judgments had to do with the, um, the possibility of allowing a class action, which is specifically provided for in Section 38 of the Constitution. Now, we all know what a class action is. I believe you have lots of this in, in, in Brazil. But in the South African context, um, in principle, but you have to ask permission of the court, and this is important. When you bring a case on behalf of certain applicant or applicants, and yet the um, subject matter of the case would address the situation of, of a whole category of people who will be similarly affected, you could ask the permission of the court to, uh, to bring a class action on behalf literally of the whole class of people. And in the case of Gusa, for example, what happened here is that a particular provincial government in South Africa unilaterally withdraw uh, one of the social assistance benefits, the so-called disability grant, on the basis that um, everybody had to reapply again in view of the corruption um, that uh, was rife. The court, in this case it was the Supreme Court of Appeal, but dealing with the matter on a constitutional basis, said, what, well, wait a moment, what are we talking about here? We are talking here about depriving people, or some of them at least, who are in any event entitled to this very protection of the law. Right. There's no basis in law, whether it's administrative law or constitutional law specifically, to adopt this particular measure as far as those who are legally entitled to protection. And that being the case, in other words, the provincial government had acted without any authority. From a constitutional perspective, the court said, and given, and this is now important, the vulnerability of the class of people being affected by the decision of provincial government, we will allow a class action on behalf of literally a very large segment of the population in the in a particular province, the Eastern Cape. Um, let me, um, I think we almost only time for maybe a remark about separation of powers and then the conclusions. The next two slides will give you an insight into the approach that the Constitutional Court took um, as regards the, um, this doctrine um, of separation of powers. And I'm reading to you, the Court said, and this is in the, um, um, actually the first major judgment of the Court on the Constitutional Framework, it is true that the inclusion of socioeconomic rights may result in courts, in the courts making orders which have direct implications for budgetary matters. However, even when a court enforces civil and political rights such as equality, freedom of speech, and the right to a fair trial, the order it makes will often have such implications. A court may require the provision of legal aid or the extension of state benefits to a class of people who formerly were not beneficiaries of such benefits. In our view, it cannot be said that by including socioeconomic rights within a Bill of Rights, the task is conferred upon the courts so different from that ordinarily conferred upon them by a Bill of Rights that it results in a breach of the separation of powers." Unquote. And then in the um, Treatment Action Campaign case, the one about antiretroviral treatment, the court had this to say, the state policy is challenged as inconsistent with the Constitution. Courts have to consider whether in formulating and implementing such policy the state has given effect to its constitutional obligations. If it should hold in any given case that the state has failed to do so, it is obliged by the Constitution to say so, in so far as that constitutes an intrusion into the domain of the executive, that is an intrusion mandated by the Constitution itself." Unquote. And I think that settles the matter. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I think I need to go to my few conclusions. So although there's some very interesting issues around the access to, which brings into play again the interrelationship, um, but maybe we can discuss this at a later stage. Um, this is an issue that we have discussed already to some extent. So, conclusions. I think at least in the early days, we see some kind of reticence lately, the Constitutional Court has been extremely progressive in the uh, development of not just jurisprudence, but almost like a kind of a, 
of a theoretical basis for jurisprudence in socioeconomic rights. Um, it made clear there's an, in a need for enhanced constitutional supervision. Think of the quotation on separation of powers. Um, in some cases, what it did was to ask role players such as the African Human Rights Commission to help monitor the compliance with the court's order. The policy legislative changes in this area have become, as a result of the jurisprudence, less reactionary and perhaps you can say more proactive, which of course is a good thing. Uh, specific conclusions, the um, extensive power of the courts to interfere and the wide remedies at their disposal. A comprehensive and integrated approach is required. Um, I think it flows from what we have said. Um, there is effectively, one would like to think, an obligation on government to make sure that there is a policy-based program and legislative implementation that would match the constitutional framework. So, uh, positive obligation to be proactive. Um, importantly here is a range of reasonable measures at the disposal of, of the state. In other words, as I've said before, uh, neither the uh, Constitution nor the courts would be prescriptive as to what those steps would be um, unless it would, were to find in a particular case that they, the steps were unreasonable. It could either normally would send government back to the drawing board, but in a highly exceptional circumstances such as in Hrupum and in TAC, the court would actually say, well, in our view, um, this is the minimum that you have to do and I'm ordering you to do that. Provision of housing, provision of antiretroviral treatment, um, allocation of responsibility, sufficient budgetary support would have to be in place. Um, you cannot just um, try and shield yourself, the government say, well, it's going to be costly. The costliness of a measure would always have to be weighed up against the, um, um, the ramifications if you were not uh, giving effect, or were not to give effect to the constitutional domain. Uh, constitutional focus on vulnerable groups. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'm going to end there. Um, just with a final remark, I mentioned the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights before. As you would probably know, the, um, the way in which the covenant has been interpreted thus far is to say that at least um, countries would have to make sure that there is a core content of the particular right that is being protected and recognized. So the core content is, is a crucial concept within the framework of, of international law. Um, in fact, we see this um, in the broad area of social protection increasingly. Um, and uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with the developments, the uh, adoption in 2012 by the ILO of Recommendation 202 on national flaws of social protection but the whole emphasis in the social protection floor debate I mean, would, would render support to this minimum core content. Um, now, what the South African Constitutional Court did at an early stage is to say, well, you know, we are not bound by the core content, um, uh, what shall we call it, um, paradigm, so to say. For us, what the Constitution requires is the reasonableness of the measures. Um, and of course, it's been criticized very heavily, so yes, reasonableness, but it should still be subject to a core content. The issue now is South Africa ratified this uh, covenant in uh, January 2015. And it's clear that uh, this area would, or this issue would have to be reconsidered by the Constitutional Court in view of South Africa's international obligations. So uh, we think there's an um, interesting scope for further development, jurisprudentially so. Uh, from that particular perspective. I thank you. E agora passamos uh, as perguntas.
of the way how you interpret uh, constitution and fundamental rights due to the fact that I have heard that in terms of jurisprudence so as to um, develop in the highest level of this protection, your constitution allows you to use uh, foreign jurisprudence. So I am a little bit afraid of uh, internal sovereignty because of it. Because as you said, to, to reach this, this level of protection of fundamental rights, you have a history, you have, you have a history, your country has a parco personnel. So how, how do you see this? this uh, this uh, development, and in the same time, this risk of losing uh, internal sovereignty. Did, 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 I make my, did I make myself clear or not? Yeah. I think the question is clear. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you very much. This is a this is a crucial question, um, and maybe we could ask ourselves after 20 years of almost 20 years of constitutional jurisprudence, um, has internal sovereignty, to use your term, in terms of constitutional jurisprudence, has this fallen by the wayside? Um, I don't think so. Not at all. Let me start with. Uh, unpacking the Constitution itself for you first. The um, provision which is relevant here is Section 39 of the Constitution on the Interpretation of Fundamental Rights. And I mentioned one of the provisions, and that is provision in relation to international law. And international law is something different from the law of other jurisdictions. So there is an, indeed an obligation on the Constitutional Court, for example, to consider international law. And as I said, this has been interpreted to mean both binding and non-binding international law. But please um, bear in mind that consideration does not mean application. Um, you have to apply, of course, binding international law, ratified international law, so to say. Um, but you have to take, you have to consider other parts of international law and non-ratified non international instruments, for example, if they are relevant. At least you have to consider them. Um, and as far as that is concerned, I think that's exactly what the court has done. The court uh, took into account um, uh, even non-binding international law. Remember what I said at the end? The issue of the core content was rejected, actually, by the Constitutional Court. But that was at a stage when South Africa was not bound by the International Covenant on Economic and Sociocultural Rights. Now it is bound in view of its ratification in January this year. Um, but then, as far as foreign jurisdictions or as foreign jurisprudence concerned, the following. The same section 39 says that every court tribunal forum may consider foreign law. And that must. So unlike international law, uh, there's a discretion. That's the first thing. The second thing is that in uh, deciding whether it will take into account foreign law, the constitutional court has laid emphasis on quite a few things. First, it must be comparable. In other words, other jurisdictions where fundamental rights are in fact entrenched uh, and uh, you're constitutionally recognized. Um, so it has, for example, looked at parts of the Indian constitutional, constitutional jurisprudence, the US jurisprudence, Canadian, um, and I think even at times the Brazilian. Um, but we, you never have I never had the impression over the years that the court would feel constrained or bound um, in any sense of the word by what other jurisdictions may have done. Very often it would say, well, you know, this is, these are interesting developments, we learn from this, um, but we have our own particular context in South Africa. So um, now I would certainly not say that, um, in my own personal view, that, that the issue, to use your term, internal sovereignty, has, has been lost. Uh, and in fact, the contrary. 
um, South African jurisprudence is sort of, I could say, is very independent uh, from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that. And you have like apartheid in South Africa, in South Africa, and here you have slavery, and it was really bad. It was like a massive problem here. And however, like uh, 120 years that they stopped, however, we still have the impacts. And Brazil suffered like for a massive as social atheism with the countries that we need the most here. And here in your lecture, you said that uh, the judiciary should be more proactive. So the judiciary should be like the protagonism, or it should be like a fusion of the public? Or is active legislative, or should the judiciary uh, be the protagonism of the Of the Constitution? Yeah, of, yes, of the, to, yes, to try to, to equi uh, equalize the situation. Should be the judiciary the protagonism to, to end the social atheism or like a uh, diffusion of the public? Let me try and answer this for you differently. Um, and I'm saying this from the perspective of the particular South African constitutional context and the jurisprudence that we have seen thus far. Um, I don't know of any adjustment of the Constitutional Court which would actually order the South African government to develop a whole area that hasn't yet been developed in terms of policy or legislation. Um, unlike what you would find in a few other constitutional jurisdictions, the court has never gone that far, but the court has certainly, and very explicitly so, um, engaged extensively with, with um, legal frameworks, uh, lack or lacunae in the legal frameworks, policy context, uh, to gauge and evaluate whether those were um, aligned sufficiently to the constitutional context. And this it has done rigorously. Um, but this shouldn't mask um, the extent of the, uh, what the court has effectively done through its jurisprudence to help address the issue of historical imbalance uh, in the country. Except for everything that I've said until now, um, and there's something I just mentioned briefly, the, the jurisprudence on substantive equality is vast. It's extensive, it's comprehensive, it's progressive in South Africa. How the court has used the constitution to say that what are the implications of bring, bringing about true equality in the country, um, making it very clear that and just by adopting legislation or policies that would now say that people are equal, you do not make people equal purely on the basis of a law and a policy. Uh, you may have to do more. And you may have to interpret that legislation and you may have to interpret that policy from a perspective that would ensure that people are, that a their position is properly addressed. Um, maybe I could give you um, just two examples of this, and uh, these are both labor law examples. Uh, the first had to deal with, um, the case was the Van Heerden case. It dealt with um, pension benefits to parliamentarians in South Africa. Now here you have got many senators and you have uh, lower house people now. We have got parliamentarians in South Africa. Now, interestingly for the, for the younger generation of parliamentarians, I'm not saying young parliamentarians, but the younger generation, a separate scheme was set up which was in a certain extent more lucrative than for people who were parliamentarians under the old regime and the old dispensation, but also became parliamentarians in the new system. But of course, on the face of it, this is discrimination. And the court said, but well, wait a moment. Look at the context. Those who came to parliament recently are people who never had the opportunity to provide for their own um, uh, pension benefits, um, unlike the others who have been there for, for quite some time. So there is sufficient justification in, on the basis of substantive equality to give preference to um, to parliamentarians who were historically disadvantaged under the old framework. Interesting. Um, and then the second case is a very recent one. This is about the uh, promotion of a uh, police officer in the South African Police Service. 
it's a lady, um, a white lady, I must say. And the reason why I say a white lady is that um, even though the Constitution does not stipulate the categories of um, historically disadvantaged groups from a quality perspective, the uh, other laws like the um, Employment Equity Act would make it clear that you know there are three major categories. Um, Africans, if you like, and Africans would include them in the South African context, blacks and coloreds and Indians, and secondly, uh, people who are disabled, and thirdly, gender, uh, females. So females, indeed, would constitute one of the historically disadvantaged groups. So this lady was actually recommended twice by the Selection Committee for Promotion, and yet the National Police Com um, uh, Commissioner, National Police Commission South Africa refused the appointment on the basis that, um, that this position should go to a person who was historically even more advantaged from the African context in this case. Um, this case, I mean, it was a case that took many years to before it reached the Constitutional Court, but some months ago the Constitutional Court said, well, let's look at at what the Constitution and the Equality Framework is all about. It's about redressing historical disadvantage. And in redressing historical disadvantage, you, you may have to take into account that even for those who were historically disadvantaged, they, 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 even there it could be a classification of who were more historically disadvantaged. And it is clear that, um, that Africans in particular were totally excluded under the old system of you know, proper promotion in South African police service, unlike white females. Uh, and in order to redress the balance, which is also a numerical imbalance in the South African Police Service and the senior ranks, um, we have to allow the National Co Police Commissioner uh, to um, give preference to uh, the appointment of an African to this position. Um, so fairly dramatic, fairly far-reaching, maybe not from a resilient perspective, mm -hmm. but it's, it's certainly far-reaching. Um, but I think it gives you a sense of how extensive, some would say radical, but how extensive the Constitutional Court would interpret the uh, substantive equality uh, um, requirement of the Constitution. Thank you very much, Professor, for the government to include a very interesting e, e passamos agora então ao palavra o professor Paulo Malata Pinto, também é, muito conhecido de todos nós, professor da Universidade de Coimbra e participa é, desses eventos no Brasil e na Alemanha, também formado na Universidade de é, Munique, doutorado na Universidade de Munique que vai nos falar aqui, na verdade nós vamos fazer uma corrigenda, portanto, no programa, que vai falar sobre a proteção da confiança na jurisprudência do Tribunal é, Constitucional. E, sem mais delongas, passo a palavra a esse nosso eminente amigo. Muito obrigado. Permitam-me que, uma vez que eu não tenho uma apresentação, uh, uh, falo de, de sentado, uh, e queria... Uh, Cumprimentar, agradecer o convite, cumprimentar o Ministro Gilmar Mendes, agradecer ao Instituto Brasiliense de Direito Público, cumprimentar também os meus colegas de mesa, o professor Mário Oliver, o professor Luís Speca, que já teve de sair, e a professora uh, Fátima. Queria uh, uh, também, uh, enfim, pedir desculpa se houver algum aspecto, algum ponto que, pelo meu sotaque, não seja imediatamente compreensível, com certeza que no debate poderemos, poderemos esclarecer. Eu eh, decidi retomar uma análise que fiz eh, há algum tempo daquilo que designamos, que alguns designaram a jurisprudência da crise. Isto é, os acórdãos que o Tribunal Constitucional Português eh, preferiu sobre medidas de austeridade, sobre medidas que foram eh, implementadas durante a crise financeira que Portugal atravessou desde 2011 a 2014 e de, de, que, de que está ainda saindo. Uh, e, e, e decidi analisar essa, 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 essa jurisprudência na perspectiva do parâmetro da proteção da confiança, que foi um parâmetro invocado várias vezes em vários acordos do Tribunal Constitucional, houve outros como o princípio da igualdade, o princípio da proporcionalidade, 
mas parece-me interessante analisar a questão da proteção da confiança nestes acórdãos sobre medidas que afetaram, em parte, direitos sociais. Eu queria fazer aqui um pequeno, uma pequena introdução para dizer que a Constituição portuguesa, como sabem, é uma Constituição de, desta nova vaga de Constituições eh, longas, em que se insere também a Constituição brasileira. Tem um catálogo relativamente extenso de direitos fundamentais e, e divide os direitos fundamentais em, em duas grandes categorias. Em primeiro lugar, tem os direitos, o que nós chamamos de direitos, liberdades e garantias, que correspondem, em termos sumários, aos direitos negativos, ou que correspondem ao estatuto negativo, à da primeira geração, alguns da segunda geração, também direitos de participação política, e depois tem aquilo que nós designamos direitos económicos, sociais e culturais. Nestes, sim, encontram-se o direito ao trabalho, os direitos dos consumidores, a iniciativa privada, o direito de propriedade privada, que tem uma dimensão negativa também, mas está aqui, Uh, direitos como o direito à saúde uh, 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 e, e direitos culturais. Uh, a jurisprudência portuguesa não é, isto para dizer alguma coisa também sobre o tema de que falaram os meus colegas anteriores, não, não é uma jurisprudência, digamos, dirigista ou que, uh, pelo menos ao nível da jurisprudência constitucional, condena a realização de prestações. Isto prende-se com duas razões. Há uma razão, digamos, dogmática, Prevalentemente na doutrina, estas normas são vistas como normas programáticas que fixam incumbências, funções do Estado, mas que carecem de ser concretizadas pelo legislador. Mas, sobretudo, em segundo lugar, o Tribunal Constitucional Português só aprecia a inconstitucionalidade de normas. Normas em si mesmas ou em suas interpretações. Portanto, é certo que nós temos, por vezes, nos tribunais administrativos, recursos contra o encerramento de um serviço de urgência ou contra o encerramento de uma maternidade normalmente esses atos normalmente não se trata tanto da condenação a novas prestações, mas de reação contra encerramentos ou contra limitações. E normalmente também o poder político, o poder legislativo, o poder executivo just, tenta justificar esses atos através de ganhos de eficiência. Dizendo, por exemplo, que havia excessivas maternidades e era preciso para melhorar a saúde pública, para melhorar os cuidados, concentrá-las nas cidades melhorando com o sistema de transporte. E nessa avaliação, nessa ponderação, o Tribunal normalmente já não entra, em regra. Mas, portanto, há poucas condenações à prestação de... Uh, isso é sobretudo uma questão política. Houve recentemente um caso muito conhecido uh, que causou alguma polémica uh, de, 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 em que o Estado... Uh, foi iniciada uma ação, mas não foi, foi, não foi necessário chegar ao fim, em que estava em causa um tratamento inovador para a hepatite B, que custava dezenas de milhares de euros, portanto, 25 mil dólares, 30 mil dólares, por doente. Havia uns milhares de doentes em Portugal. O Estado acabou por uh, decidir financiar num processo de negociação com os laboratórios. Uh, mas, enfim, uh, não, não há casos, não são muito conhecidos casos de condenação a novas prestações. Queria dizer também que a jurisprudência do Tribunal, uh, embora não no domínio da saúde, uh, uh, reconheceu, porém, que o chamado rendimento mínimo garantido, ou rendimento social de inserção, que foi uma prestação que foi criada nos anos 90, em 95, não podia ser abolido, não podia ser eliminado, como se tentou em 2001, para os jovens de 18 a 25 anos. Fundamentalmente, o, poder, o governo, em 95, criou uma nova prestação social chamada rendimento social de inserção. Primeiro chamava-se rendimento mínimo garantido, mais tarde mudou. A ideia é, no fundo, uma prestação que não depende de desconto, não tem a ver com o subsídio de desemprego, não está limitado no tempo, e que visa, no fundo, em relação àquelas pessoas que não têm qualquer prestação, qualquer rendimento, dar-lhes um rendimento mínimo para a reinserção a troco de certas condicionalidades, frequência de cursos, aceitação de empregos, se existirem, etc. Em 2001, o Governo decidiu eliminar essa prestação para os jovens dos 18 aos 25 anos, com o argumento de que isto fomentava o que nós designamos de subsídio ou dependência e que nos jovens enfim, não havia um desemprego jovem muito elevado e, portanto, não era justificado. O Tribunal Constitucional entendeu, no Acórdão 509 de 2002, que essa eliminação era inconstitucional porque violava o direito ao mínimo de existência, mas não a fundamentou 
na, no, no, no direito à segurança social. Fundamentou diretamente na dignidade da pessoa humana, no artigo 1 da Constituição. Uh, enfim, foi uma decisão, é uma decisão discutida na doutrina portuguesa, é uma decisão que tem consequências orçamentais, evidentemente, uh, mas, uh, mas, mas, mas é uma decisão que foi aplicada. E mais recentemente, um acordo interessante de 2015, mais recente, o acordo 296 de 2015, esteve em questão saber se uh, o Estado podia, porque uh, uma nova lei tinha previsto isso, podia condicionar esse rendimento para estrangeiros ou para residentes em Portugal a um mínimo de três anos de residência. Isto é, houve uma alteração de regime jurídico em 2014, 2013, que condicionou para os cidadãos estrangeiros que residissem em Portugal a um mínimo de três anos. Só ao fim de três anos de residência em Portugal se ganharia direito a receber este rendimento social de inserção. E o Tribunal, novamente, considerou inconstitucional esta limitação por considerar que era um rendimento que não dependia da nacionalidade portuguesa e enfim, se bastava com a residência legal em Portugal, que o prazo de espera de três anos, tendo em conta as finalidades daquela, daquela prestação, era inconstitucional, violava aquele parâmetro. São casos realmente de normas, em que, de condenações a prestações, mas é curioso que estas decisões se basearam diretamente no princípio da dignidade da pessoa humana tendo em causa o um rendimento mínimo, o direito ao mínimo de existência. Não se encontram condenações a prestações, não são, fora disso, não são frequentes. Este é, portanto, o entendimento prevalente, digamos, o pano de fundo do entendimento jurisprudencial dos direitos sociais. Eu queria centrar-me agora na jurisprudência do Tribunal durante estes anos de crise. Como sabem, para fazer um pequeno, uma pequena introdução, a Europa foi atingida por uma crise, a União Europeia, financeira, na sequência da crise financeira de 2008-2009, ela transformou-se depois numa crise de dívida pública na Europa, primeiro com a Grécia em 2010, depois a Irlanda, baseada sobretudo numa crise do sistema bancário, Portugal também, estes três países tiveram de fazer pedidos de ajuda de financiamento externo, ou o FMI, é uma troika de financiadores, nós chamávamos, chamávamos de troika, porque era constituída pelo FMI, pelo Banco Central Europeu e pela Comissão Europeia, e também a Espanha também teve um programa, mas foi um programa específico só para o sistema bancário, só para os bancos, e sobretudo para as caixas, não para os grandes bancos, mas para as caixas da forro locais. Essa, durante essa crise, foi, o Portugal fez um pedido de ajuda em, em abril de 2011, e foi acertado com os financiadores um memorando, sobre as, chamado memorando, sobre as, memorando de entendimento sobre as condicionalidades da política económica e financeira. E nesse memorando foi previsto um conjunto de medidas de austeridade que Portugal teria de, nos anos seguintes, adotar para realmente reequilibrar as suas finanças. Esse memorando suscita muitos problemas de constitucionalidade. Há quem, aliás, ainda recentemente, numa conversa com o professor Canutilho, a propósito da questão das estruturas normativas. Me recordo, temos falado sobre a questão da situação desse memorando, qual é, o, qual é a posição dele no ordenamento jurídico. É infraconstitucional, é supraconstitucional, porque ainda por cima foi aprovado numa altura em que o Parlamento português estava dissolvido, porque ia haver eleições. Portanto, levanta vários problemas. Há uma, há uma discussão na doutrina portuguesa sobre qual a posição desse acordo internacional com os financiadores Uh, e, a sua, e a sua vinculatividade jurídica. Uh, mas, seja como for, o que é certo é que esse memorando se traduziu em diversas medidas de austeridade. Essas medidas foram objeto de um, de um intenso controle judicial. Controle judicial que é, é interessante, sob o ponto de vista jurídico ou constitucional, mas que teve também uma muito ampla, muito relevante dimensão política. Não sei se foi aqui anunciado, mas houve uma espécie de conflito, de confronto e mesmo de choque entre o Governo e o Parlamento, por um lado, e o Tribunal Constitucional, por outro, em, em, muitas, em algumas destas decisões. E eu vou-me centrar nesses acórdãos, vou dar alguns exemplos, uh, sobretudo em, tendo em conta uh, aqueles que se basearam, ou que invocaram o princípio da, da proteção da confiança. Em primeiro lugar, o que é este princípio? Uh, Recordo-me, depois de algumas destas decisões, falar com outros colegas, juristas e não juristas, e me dizerem eu não encontro na Constituição o princípio da confiança. Não está. Não, evidentemente não há uma norma, mas é evidente que é um subprincípio do princípio do Estado de Direito. 
é aí que se baseia no princípio da segurança jurídica, é aí que se baseia, por exemplo, a proibição da retroatividade das leis. Nós não temos uma proibição geral de retroatividade das leis, temos especificamente uma proibição da retroatividade de lei penal e de lei fiscal, mas em geral baseia-se neste princípio da segurança, certeza do direito e, portanto, podíamos dizer um subprincípio da confiança, que é, portanto, um elemento, uma dimensão do princípio do Estado de Direito. Já antes da, desta, desta uh, uh, crise, e antes dos anos 80 e nos anos 90, uh, o Tribunal Constitucional veio a elaborar uma jurisprudência sobre uh, os limites à legislação em resultado da proteção de expectativas. Uh, dizendo, mas sempre com, chama a atenção para isto, sempre com conceitos indeterminados. A formulação aqui é difícil de precisar. Dizendo, bem, não há um direito geral à não frustração de expectativas pelos cidadãos. Há uma liberdade de conformação do legislador. O legislador tem a liberdade de alterar o direito vigente. Todavia, se essa afetação for arbitrária ou excessivamente onerosa, isto é, se, houver uma, se for uma mutação da ordem jurídica com que razoavelmente os destinatários não possam contar devido ao comportamento anterior do próprio Estado, isto é, o Estado criou essas expectativas, e se não for ditada pela necessidade de proteger outros direitos ou interesses constitucionalmente protegidos, há aqui um balanceamento uh, pelo princípio da proporcionalidade, então viola o princípio da confiança. Estão a ver, há aqui vários conceitos indeterminados. O que é ser inadmissível, arbitrário, excessivamente oneroso? O que é não ser justificada pela salvaguarda de outros princípios? Há aqui uma atividade de ponderação relevante. Mais recentemente, em 2009, pouco antes destes acórdãos, o Tribunal chegou a sistematizar os critérios que tinha elaborado antes. Disse que é preciso que o Estado, em especial o legislador, tenha, tomado, tenha assumido comportamentos capazes de gerar nos privados expectativas de continuidade. Depois as expectativas devem ser legítimas, isto é, justificadas, fundadas em boas razões. Depois os privados devem ter tido tempo para fundar planos de vida, o que se designa um investimento na confiança devido a essa continuidade do comportamento, isto é, o requisito de investimento na confiança, porque passou algum tempo, porque essas expectativas foram dadas a conhecer. Não... E, por último, é necessário que, em ponderação, não haja razões de interesse público que justifiquem uma alteração, a não continuidade do comportamento que gerou a situação de expectativa. Com base nesta jurisprudência, por exemplo, o Tribunal julgou que eram constitucionais certas alterações ao regime das pensões. O pano de fundo aqui é o seguinte... Em Portugal existe um, um problema grave de sustentabilidade do regime de pensões. Por várias razões, mas uma delas, muito importante, é uma razão demográfica. Enfim, realmente, em Portugal neste momento não nascem crianças suficientes para assegurar a continuidade do nível de população. E, portanto, isso, entre outras consequências, tem a consequência de pôr em causa a sustentabilidade do sistema de pensões, que em Portugal não é um sistema de capitalização, é um sistema de repartição, isto é, as pensões atuais são pagas pelos descontos de quem está atualmente a trabalhar. Não há uma capitalização como um plano de poupança. Uh, e o Tribunal considerou, por exemplo, que a introdução de um limite superior a uma parcela de pensão, uh, que integra a fórmula de cálculo, aplicável só para as pensões que se iniciassem em 31 de dezembro de 2016, isto é, pensões ainda em formação, não já em pagamento, era constitucional considerou que o aumento da idade de reforma, a introdução de novas regras de cálculo de pensões em informação, com regimes transitórios, era constitucional, porque era ditado por uma razão de interesse público, de salvaguarda da sustentabilidade do sistema em geral. Isto antes ainda da crise, são acordos de 2009, 2010, como eu disse, a crise financeira em Portugal atingiu Portugal a partir de, sobretudo, meados de 2010, com a necessidade de pedido de ajuda em 2011. Uh, Passando a esses acórdãos sobre as medidas de austeridade, houve casos em que o princípio da confiança foi invocado. Um dos primeiros acórdãos que julgou, julgou, chegou a uma solução de inconstitucionalidade, embora não tivesse chegado a apreciar o princípio da confiança, eu falo dele porque foi um acórdão particularmente relevante, foi uma, uma decisão em que esteve em causa a suspensão do pagamento dos subsídios de férias e de Natal aos trabalhadores públicos, aos servidores públicos. Portanto, em Portugal ganha-se, não sei como é no Brasil, mas ganha-se 14 meses. Há dos 12 meses, há uma, um pagamento extra no, no, no verão, de férias, e outro no Natal. Portanto, isso, nós chamamos isso subsídio de férias, subsídio de Natal. 
uh, o legislador entendeu em 2011 que tinha de suspender o pagamento uh, uh, dos subsídios de férias e de Natal uh, para, 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 para o ano de 2012. Isto ficou previsto no, no, no Orçamento de Estado e, uh, portanto, reduzindo portanto, cerca de 14% do rendimento anual, porque cada mês é mais ou menos 7% ou 8%, do rendimento anual e, portanto, e só para os trabalhadores do setor público. O Tribunal apreciou, à luz do princípio da igualdade e da proporcionalidade, e considerou inconstitucionais estas, estas, estas razões. É um acordo que tem sido muito discutido, estas, estas distinções. É um acordo que tem sido muito discutido porque o Tribunal não, não considerou que só os servidores públicos é que são pagos com base em receitas públicas. E, portanto, se a situação é uma situação de urgência de crise das finanças públicas, só o Estado é que precisou de fazer um pedido de ajuda, é, é, era, a meu ver, compreensível que a austeridade incidisse sobretudo sobre esses. Enfim, mas o Tribunal, na altura, considerou que era uma, usou aqui o, o que chamou o princípio da igualdade proporcional. A ideia de que a diferenciação e além da justa medida, uma vez que só atingia os, os servidores públicos. Depois há outros acórdãos, eu tenho aqui cinco ou seis decisões, vou, vou referir essas medidas, onde o Tribunal chegou a confrontar com o princípio da confiança, mas chegou também a uma decisão de não inconstitucionalidade. Uma primeira decisão, do de final de 2010, esteve em causa o agravamento do imposto de renda, de rendimento, para rendimentos oferidos antes da entrada em vigor da lei. Isto é, estava em causa o imposto de rendimento do ano de 2010. E em junho de 2010, quando já tinham decorrido seis meses, o legislador agravou o imposto para esse, para esse ano todo. E mandou aplicar aos rendimentos de todo o ano. E houve, quem, houve um recurso. E, 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 por menos, havia retroatividade da lei fiscal. O Tribunal pôs em causa a legitimidade da expectativa dos contribuintes, dizendo que, no fundo, o rendimento só se apura no final do ano, embora fosse obtido mês a mês, Uh, e afirmou que, este foi o decisivo, existiam razões imperiosas de interesse público para, para as medidas, desigualmente o equilíbrio das finanças públicas. Portanto, assumiu aqui uma quebra dentro do próprio ano, não para anos anteriores, mas dentro do próprio ano, de certa forma, do, da proibição da retroatividade fiscal. Admitiu que o, a taxa agravada de imposto se aplicasse a todo o ano, uh, e considerou que um, era uma espécie de retroatividade inautêntica, porque... Um, e, portanto, não estava expressa, não estava abrangida pela proibição expressa da retroatividade fiscal, porque, dizendo que o rendimento só se apura e só se declara no final do ano. Facilitou um pouco aqui, a meu ver. Depois, um outro acórdão julgou a redução remuneratória que foi prevista para servidores públicos com remunerações superiores a 1.500 euros, cerca de 2.000 dólares, em 2011, o legislador eh, viu-se forçado a prever, a reduzir o salário dos servidores públicos entre 3,5% e 10%. Portanto, era progressivo, para quem tinha mais de 1.500 euros de salário, eh, era progressivo até, eh, enfim, podia chegar aos 10%. Eh, foi foi uma, 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 uma redução também para eh, equilibrar as finanças públicas. O Tribunal confrontou com o princípio da confiança, Devo dizer que a jurisprudência constitucional em Portugal parte da ideia de que, em regra, é vedado reduzir o salário do servidor público. O jogador não pode fazer isso arbitrariamente. Há uma expectativa na sua manutenção, digamos assim, há um direito à sua manutenção. O Tribunal começou por afirmar que existem expectativas, uma redução remuneratória universal não cai na zona de previsibilidade do comportamento dos, dos, dos decisores públicos. Uh, mas disse que isto se enquadrava numa estratégia global delineada a nível europeu, que forçava uma drástica redução de despesas públicas uh, e, portanto, assumindo a relevância do objetivo perseguido num contexto de excepcionalidade, afirmou uh, a liberdade das opções políticas e, embora deixando em aberto a possibilidade de futuramente uh, se tivesse, digamos, superado esse contexto de excepcionalidade, isso levantou a discussão saber se é só para este ano ou se se mantiver nos próximos anos o Tribunal declarará inconstitucional. O Tribunal neste ano deixou passar a redução remuneratória. Outro acórdão de 2013 veio a limitar, houve uma alteração do elenco dos feriados obrigatórios. Portanto, vários feriados, 
Por exemplo, o 1 de novembro, o dia de todos os santos, foi, 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 foi suspenso durante estes três anos, parece que agora será reinstituído, mas outros, outros, alguns outros também, portanto, houve quatro ou cinco feriados que foram uh, eliminados. E também uh, previu-se que uh, os instrumentos de regulamentação coletiva de trabalho, os contratos coletivos de trabalho, não poderiam derrogar as limitações de indemnizações e compensações para cessação por despedimento, cessação do contrato de trabalho. Portanto, estas duas normas foram impugnadas também por violação do princípio da confiança. No curso junto do Tribunal Constitucional, bem, nós tínhamos a expectativa à manutenção dos feriados, tínhamos a expectativa a que a nossa Convenção Coletiva de Trabalho pudesse manter as indemnizações e compensações. O Tribunal, de novo, veio afirmar que não havia um direito à manutenção do elenco legal dos feriados obrigatórios, não havia uma expectativa legítima e digna de tutela, que isto caía dentro da liberdade de conformação do legislador, portanto, não, não, não havia violação da confiança, e o mesmo para a, a eficácia das, das convenções coletivas de trabalho. Disse o mesmo para o aumento para 40 horas semanais do horário de trabalho dos servidores públicos. Em Portugal, os servidores públicos trabalhavam até 2012 35 horas, mas, as, mas o horário geral de trabalho era 40 horas, enfim, com variações. Uh, o Tribunal considerou que essa equiparação não violava a confiança, até porque existe uma tendência crescente para o que se chamou a laboralização do estatuto do servidor público, isto é, uma aproximação do estatuto do trabalhador privado. Portanto, considerou que esse aumento de 35 para 40 horas não era inconstitucional. Uh, e o mesmo, enfim, talvez o acórdão que foi a decisão mais, mais, mais polémica, foi uma decisão de 2013 que avaliou um conjunto de, de normas do orçamento para 2013. Uh, suspensão novamente do subsídio de férias, novamente a remoção remuneratória. Uh, eu eu vou, vou, vou passar sobre a análise em detalhe destas medidas, mas gostava de dizer que aqui também não esteve em causa o princípio da confiança. Isto é, o princípio da confiança, uh, designadamente quanto às pensões, uh, o, o, o legislador uh, uh, aceitou que, em relação a pensões, a informação, se pudesse uh, limitar as, as pensões futuras, Uh, por exemplo, uh, uma medida que foi prevista foi a suspensão de 90% do subsídio de férias dos pensionistas. Isto é, uh, enfim, o, o, tal como para os, os trabalhadores tinha sido suspenso o pagamento do subsídio de férias, isso não tinha até então afet, afetado os pensionistas já, já a receber pensões. Uh, 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 até, agora, até então só tinha afetado os pensionistas cujas pensões estavam em informação. O legislador entendeu, o Governo entendeu, bem, isto é injusto, nós estarmos a suspender os subsídios de férias aos trabalhadores que estão a trabalhar e, em relação aos pensionistas, continuamos a pagar-lhes 14 pensões. Portanto, suspendeu 90% do subsídio de férias dos pensionistas. Apesar de reconhecer que há uma diferença entre direitos a constituir e direitos já constituídos, o Tribunal aceitou essa suspensão por esta razão de igualdade, digamos assim. E também, num outro acordo de 2014, onde esteve em causa uma limitação ao que se, chamou, ao que se chamam pensões de sobrevivência, isto é, as pensões aos familiares que sobrevivem a servidores públicos, uh, ou a eliminação de alguns complementos de pensões, considerou que não havia violação da confiança. Os acordos em que concluiu pela violação do princípio da confiança foram dois, aliás, foram três. Dois de 2013 e um mais recente de 2014. No primeiro esteve em causa a eliminação da exceção da salvaguarda uh, à aplicação de causas de despedimento, a trabalhadores públicos com um vínculo de nomeação, de nomeação definitiva. O que é isto? Fundamentalmente, nós, na função pública em Portugal, temos o Estatuto de Servidor Público, mas há também um conjunto grande de trabalhadores que têm um Estatuto de Trabalhadores semelhante ao direito privado. Esses estavam, porém, excetuados do regime geral do despedimento. Isto é, a ideia era que, apesar de eles terem um regime laboral, não se lhes aplicava o regime geral de despedimento. Por exemplo, o despedimento por encerramento da unidade produtiva por necessidades o despedimento por necessidade digamos, da empresa, isso não se aplica mesmo para esses trabalhadores porque teoricamente não há encerramento na função pública não é? e portanto havia uma exceção era, 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 havia uma cláusula de salvaguarda que excetuava para esses trabalhadores a aplicação das causas gerais de despedimento do regime do direito laboral do direito do trabalho isso foi, em 2013, foi eliminado, porque uma das medidas, um dos pontos importantes da, destas medidas de austeridade foi a redução, a fusão de institutos, a redução de despesas públicas, isso levou necessariamente a excedentes, 
e, e alguns destes seriam trabalhadores deste tipo. O Tribunal Constitucional afirmou que, uh, digamos, a, a eliminação dessa exceção, portanto, passar a permitir o despedimento de servidores públicos, mesmo com regime de trabalho semelhante aos do direito privado, não, não eram uh, com, já, já verdadeiros servidores funcionários públicos, uh, violava uma expectativa uh, legítima, que tinha assentado em boas razões, não estava em causa um mero regime de transição, afirmou a centralidade que a preservação do emprego assume as opções de vida, o facto de ter formado a expectativa ao longo do tempo, chegou a afirmar que o facto desses uh, funcionários e trabalhadores já terem sido objeto de cortes nos anos anteriores, mais tinha solidificado essa expectativa, um argumento um pouco reversível, uh, porque uh, isto, tanto poderia significar que tinha solidificado a expectativa, como podia ter mostrado que provavelmente havia necessidade de poupança. Algo que chama a atenção nesta argumentação sobre a confiança é, muitas vezes, a reversibilidade dos argumentos. Os pontos em que o Tribunal fundamenta a existência e a solidez da expectativa. Muitas vezes são reversíveis. Aqui chegou a afirmar isso. Disse, portanto, que havia uma situação de confiança imputável ao Estado, uma legitimidade dessa confiança, um investimento na confiança, o facto desses trabalhadores não terem procurado outras alternativas de emprego, porque pensavam que tinham um emprego estável, e passou a analisar em ponderação as razões de interesse público eventualmente prevalecentes, dizendo que, concluindo que elas, que elas não existiam e, portanto, que obviamente não eram prevalecentes e, portanto, julgando que era inconstitucional esta medida. Um outro acordo, onde, talvez o acordo onde o Tribunal entrou mais na liberdade de confirmação do legislador, portanto, manifestou menor tolerância e, e, e entrou mais numa atitude dirigista, foi um acordo de 2013, onde o Tribunal, digamos, censurou uma, uma norma que alterava o regime de pensões, já das pensões, mesmo das pensões em pagamento, fazendo aquilo que se chama a convergência das pensões. O que é isto? Em Portugal, durante, não sei se como é no Brasil, mas houve, durante muito tempo havia vários sistemas de pensões. Havia um sistema geral de segurança social para os trabalhadores em geral, que podiam ter os seus esquemas privados, mas havia um sistema geral de segurança social, que é também público, com descontos, e havia um esquema específico para os, para os funcionários públicos, a chamada Caixa Geral das Aposentações. Ora, o esquema da aposentação dos, dos servidores públicos era melhor, bastante melhor. Era, em média, em média, chamei atenção para isto, 10% melhor. Em média, porque havia muitas diferenças. Portanto, havia diferenças na carreira contributiva, diferenças nos descontos. Este regime da Caixa Geral das Aposentações era ele mesmo já o produto da fusão de diversos regimes. Portanto, havia diferenças, mas em média era cerca de 10% melhor, 10% das pensões. Isto é, o servidor público tinha uma apresentação melhor. Ora, uma das medidas de sustentabilidade da segurança social que o Estado quis fazer foi a convergência das pensões. Isto é, fazer a convergência com o regime geral da segurança social. Como o recálculo de todas as carreiras contributivas, de todos os descontos, era uma tarefa praticamente impossível, o jogador decidiu prever corta-se 10%, em geral, as pensões da Caixa Geral de Apresentações para a sua convergência. Isso chegou ao Tribunal Constitucional. E o Tribunal Constitucional avaliou esta medida à luz do parâmetro do princípio da confiança, julgando-a inconstitucional. Eu não, 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 não estou em desacordo com a decisão, embora pense que a decisão se devia ter baseado na inexistência de uma, de uma transição gradualista, isto é, devia haver uma transição não 10% de uma vez, devia ter havido uma transição ao longo do tempo. A decisão, a fundamentação do Tribunal, a meu ver, entra excessivamente na liberdade de conformação do legislador. Basicamente, o Tribunal, digamos, passando agora aqui um conjunto de considerações, disse que a violação das expectativas por esta convergência só se justificaria, eventualmente, no contexto de uma reforma estrutural global, que integrasse de forma abrangente a ponderação de todos os fatores relevantes. Portanto, considerou que aquela convergência pelo corte de 10% de um ano para o outro não era uma forma estrutural das pensões. O problema é o de saber se essa ponderação não compete já ao legislador, ou se é uma ponderação que o, que o Tribunal também deve fazer. Hum, e, por último, veio a, a reiterar esta decisão no acordo de 2014, onde estava em causa o legislador, não tendo podido cortar as pensões desta forma, decidiu introduzir, então, uma contribuição de sustentabilidade. Isto é, um novo imposto menor, que ia de 3,5% a 10%, e esse sim era gradual, para os aposentados da Caixa Geral de Aposentações, para os aposentados de servidores públicos. 
houve quem dissesse que o legislador estava aqui a tentar contornar a anterior decisão. Em vez de cortar, criava-se um novo imposto. É certo que era diferente, era gradual, mas o Tribunal eh, considerou também que o ônus de fundamentação não estava cumprido, que havia aqui uma afetação de expectativas. Ora, descritas estas decisões, sumariamente, eu queria eh, fazer aqui algumas considerações sobre eh, o parâmetro do princípio da proteção da confiança. É evidente que este parâmetro existe, é relevante, tem sido aplicado em muitas decisões, mas chama a atenção, na jurisprudência do Tribunal Constitucional, uma certa indeterminação ou uma certa fluidez nas formulações utilizadas. Eu já, já, já falei há pouco de algumas delas. A existência de uma situação de confiança legítima, do investimento na confiança, a ponderação com direitos ou interesses constitucionalmente assegurados e a ideia e até a reversibilidade de algumas formulações. Dizer, por exemplo, que a existência de cortes nos anos anteriores tinha solidificado a expectativa, em vez de ter... Em vez de ter o Tribunal até chegou a dizer que o facto de ter declarado inconstitucional uma medida anterior tinha também confirmado a expectativa. Isto é, firmou a expectativa, firmou a expectativa não só na atitude do legislador e do Governo, mas nas suas próprias decisões anteriores. A expectativa do Estado globalmente considerado. Uh, o problema que realmente aqui uh, este, 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 este parâmetro levanta é, como esteve já presente até na exposição anterior, no fundo o problema do respeito pela separação de poderes. A questão de saber se o Tribunal está ou não entrando na consideração política. Uh, bem, eu queria dizer que não é, a meu ver, o facto de o Estado do Tribunal se ter dotado, se ter aparelhado com os quatro testes ou requisitos referidos a existência de uma situação de confiança imputável ao Estado, a legitimidade da confiança, o um investimento na confiança, a ponderação com outros direitos. Não é isso que reduz a incerteza ou a imprevisibilidade de algumas decisões nesta área. Porque vários destes testes baseiam-se em conceitos indeterminados, como, como vimos. Hum, depois, o que está aqui em causa, ao meu ver, é sobretudo a definição do standard, do padrão, da intensidade do controle jurisdicional. Isto é, nós temos aqui no, no princípio da confiança, como no princípio da proporcionalidade, e no fundo, numa, pelo menos num dos testes, as questões são semelhantes, isto é, o controle à luz da confiança reconduz-se ao princípio da proporcionalidade quando está em causa a ponderação com outros direitos ou interesses constitucionalmente consagrados. Nós temos aqui um princípio, ou princípios, que tem uma dimensão jurídica, jurídica ou constitucional, que deve ser controlada e aplicada pelo Tribunal Constitucional, e por todos os tribunais também, mas também tem uma dimensão política. Isto é, há, fora das, daquilo que é uma manifesta, uma evidente falta de adequação ou falta de necessidade, há uma liberdade de conformação política do legislador que foi democraticamente eleito para definir que meios, que medidas é que são necessárias ou adequadas a prosseguir aqueles fins. E, digamos, é para isso que o legislador é, é, é eleito. Eu costumo dar um exemplo de um acórdão de que foi relator em 2001, em que estava em causa uma medida de que eu discordava. Mas que o Tribunal, por grande maioria, houve só três votos, houve três votos vencidos, em 13, considerou que não era inconstitucional. Eu próprio fui o relator. Eu estava em causa, não era uma questão financeira, estava em causa o regime, a constitucionalidade do regime da reserva da propriedade ou direção técnica das farmácias aos farmacêuticos. Em Portugal, como em alguns países europeus, a farmácia exigia que ou o proprietário ou o diretor técnico fosse um farmacêutico. E havia, sobretudo no comércio, grandes protestos contra isto. A ideia era que a provisão farmacêutica tinha mudado, o farmacêutico era, em grande parte, um comerciante, e, portanto, não se justificava que a propriedade fosse reservada, esse modelo... O Tribunal, na altura, depois de analisar a questão profundamente e fazer uma comparação, hoje já não é assim, hoje o regime já mudou, houve uma liberalização da propriedade das farmácias, mas chegou à conclusão que, realmente, o modelo do farmacêutico na sua farmácia talvez não fosse o mais adequado, mas isso era uma ponderação que competia o legislador fazer, não ao Tribunal, por razões funcionais e democráticas, de legitimidade, mas também por razões epistémicas, digamos assim, porque, realmente, é o legislador e o executivo que está... Então, nestas questões económicas, é evidente que está aparelhado, que tem as divisões técnicas, que tem, a, tem as área, a área do orçamento, tem a, tem, tem a direção geral do orçamento, tem todos os serviços que permitem conhecer a contabilidade do Estado, a relação entre as despesas e as receitas, saber que medidas é que são necessárias. Os tribunais, por natureza, não, não, não estão adequados, não estão aparelhados 
até sobre, para conhecer, por isso é que eu falo de razões epistémicas, essas questões de necessidade. Têm de resolver as questões com base em regras de ONUs. Isto é, o ONUs de fundamentar algumas destas medidas compete, por um lado, a quem impura e, e, e por outro lado, também a quem defende a sua constitucionalidade. Mas, portanto, o Tribunal, a meu ver, quando está em causa o princípio da confiança ou o princípio da, 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 da profissionalidade, salvo a, a, a quem de uma, de uma evidente violação ou manifesta violação destes parâmetros, o Tribunal tem de dar um crédito de confiança ao legislador. Isto é, ou está em casa. O, o problema é saber como é que se define esse critério de evidência ou critério de manifesta violação. Esta é a posição que na altura se defendeu, é a posição que eu defendo, e eu tendo a entender que, em algum destes casos, o legislador, eh, o, o Tribunal Constitucional, foi além da autocontenção, sobretudo neste caso das pensões, não porque a solução não fosse inconstitucional, mas por causa da confundimento na, na, na inexistência de gradualismo. Mas porque entrou em considerações políticas dizendo que teria de ser uma reforma estrutural. Esta não é a reforma estrutural que é necessária nas pensões. Isso já é uma ponderação a mover política. Portanto, eu penso que é necessário aqui alguma autocontenção e, sobretudo, na fiscalização abstrata. Porque na fiscalização concreta, num caso, normalmente o Tribunal tem os elementos do caso concreto e pode apreciar a justiça ou injustiça do resultado a que se chega no caso concreto. O problema é na fiscalização abstrata, isso aliás é evidente nestes casos, como é que o Tribunal julga a existência de violação do princípio da confiança numa fiscalização abstrata. O Tribunal diz, bem, é de supor, é natural, haverá, com certeza há centenas ou milhares de funcionários que levaram expectativas, mas não tem nada em concreto, não é? Portanto, sobretudo na fiscalização abstrata, é preciso ter mais autocontenção. Eu gostava, portanto, de concluir dizendo que, a meu ver, este, estes acórdãos mostraram um progressivo estreitamento do parâmetro, um progressivo estreitamento do parâmetro, num certo dirigismo constitucional. Foi uma época, hoje já ultrapassada, em que o Tribunal Constitucional foi o centro da discussão política em 2013, 2014, em Portugal. Havia uma maioria absoluta, havia um memorando que era para se aplicar medidas de austeridade, e, portanto, normalmente havia um recurso direto ao Tribunal Constitucional para proteção contra algumas dessas medidas. Felizmente, essas medidas, enfim, não, é, é, muitas dessas decisões não tiveram consequências graves, no sentido de que o país pôde superar a situação e voltar a crescer, embora, por exemplo, eh, várias decisões do Tribunal Constitucional inviabilizaram a redução da despesa pública, a redução do número de funcionários. Isso é claro. Introduziram maior rigidez na despesa pública. Eh, mas, enfim, eh, são esses também os custos, e eh, os custos perfeitamente justificados, do reconhecimento da declaração e da garantia de direitos fundamentais e existência de uma instituição, como eu defendo, eu devo dizer que eu fui, sempre fui um defensor e continuo a ser um defensor da jurisdição constitucional em Portugal, ao contrário de alguns críticos de, 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 por causa destas decisões, são esses os, é um custo que a separação de poderes, que, é, que, 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 que um sistema de reconhecimento e de garantia de direitos fundamentais tem necessariamente de aceitar. Muito obrigado.
qual é o papel do Cidreiro de Forçamento? Né? Como um garantidor de direitos substanciais, um vinculador. É, a minha curiosidade é como a, a corte portuguesa trata do direito financeiro. A corte portuguesa ela chega aí aos valores, ela se pergunta quanto a ideia do limite de gasto, a ideia do, do limite substancial do orçamento. Muito obrigado pela questão. Realmente a questão foi bem enquadrada. É sempre o um problema, digamos, dos limites constitucionais uh, ao orçamento, ou, ou visto de outra forma também, dos limites que, 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 que a restrição orçamental, uh, budget constraint, digamos assim, introduz em garantias de direitos generais. Isto visto de outra perspectiva. É? é sempre um problema que está aqui em causa. Quer no reconhecimento de prestações dos direitos sociais, quer depois, quando há uma crise do desequilíbrio, saber até onde é que essa restrição orçamental pode justificar restrições de direitos fundamentais. É claro que uma vez um limite de pré-bancarrota, como aquela de Portugal chegou em 2011, pré-bancarrota porque, como sabe, enfim, a, dívida, a dívida hoje é ruada, não, é? não, se, não se paga de um momento para o outro. Isso de um momento para o outro, como aconteceu na Europa, de, porque foi introduzido pela especulação o risco de redenominação, havia um grande risco de especulação sobre que o euro ia quebrar. Não é? E, portanto, sobretudo em relação aos países que podiam ficar fora, secaram os mercados. Aconteceu primeiro com a Grécia, aconteceu depois com a Irlanda e aconteceu a seguir com Portugal. Mas, enfim, secar, quer dizer, as, as taxas de juros estavam 10, 11 para, 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 para a dívida pública. Eram, eram incomportáveis para nós na altura. E houve mesmo uma altura onde, onde não havia mesmo procura por emissões públicas. Portanto, numa situação dessas limite para a que outra, bem, a alternativa é, é, é entre cortar alguns desses direitos, ou no ano seguinte ter de cortar muito mais. Porque se entrar em vez da outra, o corte, futuramente, vai ser maior, com certeza. Não é? Portanto, é preciso considerar também as alternativas, que são duras, são sempre alternativas imperfeitas, mas é preciso ver qual é a alternativa que se dispõe no momento. Agora, hum, acho que a questão está bem enquadrada. Como é que o Tribunal decide estas questões? São questões para as quais, eu repito, eu entendo que, por razões até epistémicas, mais estão menos bem aparelhados uhum. do que, digamos, as divisões orçamentais, de planeamento orçamental, do, do governo, etc. Isso é evidente. Os tribunais decidem, o tribunal decide com base nos elementos que são facultados. É? E um elemento que se notou crescentemente por parte do governo, mas também por parte de quem impugnava as decisões, foi facultar elementos do tribunal. Isto é, por exemplo, o governo, quando se defendeu em 2000, no início, não fez isso. Mas deu um mau resultado e, crescentemente, prestou atenção a isso. Em 2013, 2014, começou a enviar pareceres, estudos económicos, pareceres da própria Direção Geral do Orçamento, como a Amicus Futura, enviava isso para o Tribunal. Portanto, o Tribunal, nestas decisões mais, mais recentes, sim, foi dotado de elementos de informação. É claro que não, 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 não... A análise que faz não é uma análise refinada que chega ao, ao, ao pagamento, mas é normalmente por... por Trata-se de saber se existe na imponderação uma justificação com essa restrição. Porque, no fundo, é com base em grandezas. Não, sei, é um bravo, não, 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 não chega. Uh, poderá, eventualmente, uh, normalmente, uh, invocar um ou dois exemplos. Um pensionista que ganhasse 1.500 chegaria, ficaria aqui a ganhar, mas não faz análise para todos. Não sei se estou a entender. Poderá, tipicamente, uh, de resto, é, é com base em grandezas. É este o tipo de, de, de análise que o Tribunal faz. Realmente, eu, 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 é uma das razões pelas quais eu defendo que o critério que deve ser de evidência, de manifesta violação, é que uh, a decisão, a opção política, perfeitamente informada, essa deve caber ao, 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 ao Governo. Ele é que tem os dados para isso, digamos assim. E está legitimado. Não é? Obrigado, professor. Mais alguma pergunta? Só posso. Por favor. Muito obrigada pela sua apresentação. É, é, me causou muita peculiaridade o princípio da confiança na jurisprudência de crise. Né? Porque o senhor acredita que para afastá-la seria, no âmbito do tribunal, por exemplo, seria simplesmente evocando uma modulação de efeito? Eu vou, eu vou dizer onde eu quero chegar. O Brasil está entrando nessa fase né, de, uma, de uma jurisprudência de crise que ainda vai bater as portas do da nossa Corte Superior, e a tendência da nossa Corte Superior é manter os direitos fundamentais, porque essa é a característica principal dela. É, muito provavelmente, 
de debater com essas demandas de diminuição da, do direito fundamental, do direito das garantias fundamentais, o impacto orçamentário, o impacto fiscal, e muito provavelmente, muito provavelmente, a tendência do tribunal aí não ter. E ao ver aqui também esse confronto entre o parlamento e o tribunal. Só acredita que lá, enfim, quando chegar na, na Corte Superior, modulando os efeitos dessa possível é, demanda de crise, seria uma solução para afastar o princípio da confiança? Bem, é, é, eu queria dizer que. É, é, eu estou no princípio de confiança, mas há aqui há um outro conjunto de parâmetros que foi aplicado e que deve ser particularmente cuidado pelo legislador e que levou algumas decisões em relação a, por exemplo, a igualdade na repartição dos encargos. Saber se é, se é, se é igualmente. Hum... Agora, em relação a uma modulação de efeitos, deu-se o seguinte em Portugal. Uma das primeiras decisões, aquela decisão, uma das primeiras decisões que julgou inconstitucional, penso que o recorte de uma redução moratória, ou, ou, ou talvez uma redução da proposta de recursos, limitou os efeitos. Isto é, uh, considerou, a decisão foi proferida já quase no final do ano, e considerou que era inconstitucional, mas uh, por razões de previsibilidade orçamental, limitou os efeitos. Foi muito criticada como uma decisão hipócrita, na, na opinião pública. Isto é, considera inconstitucional, mas limita os efeitos. A limitação de efeitos pode levar a um certo esvaziamento também da Constituição. E, neste caso, uh, o tribunal foi um objeto de muita pressão, por dizer, como é que o tribunal, as pessoas não comentam, declara inconstitucional, mas limita os efeitos e não devolve, não ordena a devolução dos, do, do, dos salários. Mas é preciso ter cuidado na, na modulação dos efeitos, isto é, na limitação, que em Portugal pode fazer-se, pode fazer-se com o Código de Há tribunais constitucionais que não a podem fazer. Eu penso que o problema, enfim, só se pode ver caso a caso, não é? Mas, Penso que o problema no limite não está na modulação ou na limitação dos efeitos das decisões. Há um risco de desvalorizar a força normativa da Constituição se se proferem declarações verdadeiramente platónicas e inconstitucionais e depois se limitam os efeitos. Não sei se estou a fazer entender. Uh, isso é um risco sério. Né? O problema está uh, na decisão de fundo. É melhor enfrentar a questão frontalmente uh, e saber se há realmente justificação pela decisão de estabelecer, como disse, numa decisão de extrema limite, é preciso ponderar a alternativa. Mas é um ônus do governo, do usador, de mostrar que a alternativa é realmente essa. Isto é, uh, no caso português, nós tivemos quase três anos sobre assistência financeira, a alternativa, é, é, é certo que a partir de certa altura se recuperou o acesso aos mercados, depois foi reconstituído uma buffer, uma malvada de proteção, mas logo nos primeiros meses, enfim, uma, uma, uma decisão de... de que inviabilizasse algumas medidas, podia levar a Troika a, não, a suspender as trans seguintes e, portanto, o país teve de falhar pagamentos. A outra vida aí era bastante pior. Uhum. Seja, mas é uma questão de causalidade, de demonstração que esse é o resultado, que essa é a alternativa. Mais alguma questão? Por favor. O Tribunal Constitucional não tem tomado decisões das quais resultem sistematicamente, ou em áreas específicas de saúde, segurança social, condenação a prestações. 
mesmo em momentos normais que não sejam de crise. Digamos, na jurisprudência do tribunal, a decisão mais clara que se pode encontrar sobre isso é a decisão sobre o rendimento mínimo garantido das decisões sobre o chamado rendimento social de inserção, em que está em causa o mínimo de existência. E essa decisão manteve-se, isso não foi afetado em crise. Aliás, não houve qualquer tentativa de cortar... Aliás, houve, peço desculpa, houve, eu, 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 houve uma tentativa, esta de cortar, como eu disse, de cortar para os, para os, para os estrangeiros, para os residentes, que acabou por ser declarada inconstitucional eh, exigir três anos de, 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 de residência. Mas, eram, mas são montantes relativamente pequenos. Não era, não, era, não era por aí que passava a estabilidade das finanças públicas portuguesas. Portanto, não existem essas condenações a prestações com grandes consequências financeiras e o Tribunal Constitucional usa também frequentemente a ideia de que a razão pela qual é deferido, é atribuído ao legislador, digamos, a decisão sobre o ritmo de concretização é a reserva do financiamento possível. Isto é também, é também um argumento que é usado pelo Tribunal Constitucional Português. Uh, a nossa Constituição é, é, uma, é uma Constituição programática, sim. É uma Constituição programática. Mas uh, o problema, no, concretamente, na crise que nós atravessámos, não se discutiu a nível da concretização das metas. Foi a um nível muito mais concreto de cortes de prestações já, já, que já estavam sendo pagas. Ou, ou, ou que estavam em formação, o caso das pensões. Portanto, uh, digamos... Enfim, realmente isso punha em causa a concretização de algumas metas. Mas, mas o problema foi mais comezinho, foi, mais, foi mais, mais concreto, mais duro também. Era realmente a pessoa receber menos 14% do salário naquele ano. Menos subsídio de férias ou de Natal. O problema não se pôs ao nível da discussão sobre a concretização das metas. Como disse aí, o problema tem suposto, por exemplo, na saúde. Quanto a encerramentos ou racionalização do serviço de urgências o uh, encerramento de maternidades, ou também a nível da justiça, ou uma reforma do mapa judiciário, ou um encerramento de tribunais. Normalmente, a justificativa do, do Governo é com base numa ideia de racionalização e de eficiência. Não se trata de diminuir o grau de concretização. Pelo contrário, há divergência de opiniões sobre se a meta vai ser mais eficientemente concretizada. E o Tribunal normalmente não entra nessa ponderação. Não sei se me estou a fazer entender. Por exemplo, houve, um caso, houve, houve discussões no... no nos tribunais administrativos, sobre o encerramento de maternidades. Portugal foi um, país, um dos países do mundo que reduziu mais a, mater, a mortalidade infantil nos últimos 50 anos. Tinha muito grande, hoje é, está, está no, é um dos países que tem menos mortalidade infantil no mundo. E fez isso por um, uma rede de maternidades. Chegou-se à conclusão que, para melhorar ainda mais, essa, essa, era preciso fechar aquelas maternidades mais pequenas onde havia poucos nascimentos, onde só há 10 nascimentos. Porque isso não justifica ter X médicos... Uh, 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 não sei quantos uh, 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 aparelhos que era necessário concentrar. A discussão aí era sobre a eficiência, sobre a racionalização, não era sobre a diminuição do grau de concretização da meta. Na crise, o problema que se pôs foi um problema mais concreto, mais, também mais duro, era realmente cortar já o que estava a ser pago. Não sei se estou a fazer. Bem, nós continuaríamos a discutir, mas vamos para que a gente possa eventualmente ter é, é, um período mais alongado Todo para gostoso. fazer realmente é, um curso e ter as oportunidades de discutir uma série de temas. Mas queria agradecer a todos, é, agradecer aos professores, ao Tomás, ao professor, ao professor, ao professor, por essa é, interessante contribuição e também ao professor Bruno Beta e agradecer a presença de todos os senhores. Obrigado.